Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, October 6, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, look ahead at the high stakes cases for this year's Supreme Court term. Mark Joseph Stern, staff writer at Slate. Meanwhile, will the Senate create a filibuster carve out for the debt ceiling? Then, if so, how is that even possible? U.S. COVID cases and deaths on decline. Talk, uh, to, meanwhile, top experts want to scale back the Biden administration boosters plan. This is a heartwarming story. Merck will sell its federally financed COVID drug for seven times its cost. England's maskless schools leading to a COVID surge among students. 1,400 Kellogg cereal factory workers on strike in four cities around the country. New report, climate change has caused destruction of 14% of the world's, uh, world's coral in just the last 10 years. Ernst Johnson executed in Missouri despite questions of his mental capacity. 25 days out from reconciliation a deadline of the Biden administration is debating what to slash when they build back better ish plan. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is, uh, as we have coined it around here, hump day. It seems to be catching on. I'm joined uh, on this uh, Wednesday uh, by Emma Vigland, as I am on the other five days of the week that that I'm even here. Right. Well, right. Which is not five days. I mean, from a technical standpoint, that's correct. Technically, I'm accurate. Yes. Technically, yes. Technically. Yep. Mm -hmm. And also not so technically. You're, You're accurate. I'm accurate in every way. One could be accurate. I came into the office today, as you know, Emma. Mm hmm. On a bit of a high because uh, the Red Sox beat the Yankees last night. Yes. I should also say um, I get a text from uh, lawyer Matthew, uh, who, you know, our longtime listeners may be aware of. He's uh, was a longtime I am. He hasn't he's been a little bit busy as of late. And uh, he, of course, is uh, very, very interested in the Supreme Court. He mm-hmm. thinks that's one of the most important things in our politics. Um which I, I tend to agree, at least in this context. And uh, he was upset that uh, because he's a diehard Yankees fan, we've gone back and forth with this over the years, and he felt like I had purposely scheduled something about the Supreme Court today today, right. so that he has to listen. He has to tune in, well, yep. which he should be doing all the time. He should be doing all the time, but this was a no miss for him. He definitely would have stayed away to hear me. Uh, mm-hmm. You got to say go Sox. I'm, I'm I'm about to go socks and uh, but, but not, boy they just destroyed the last yeah night. it didn't look competitive at all <laughs> not no Massachusetts accent that you're gonna uh, uh, it's uh, all right uh, I mean people can get it it's implied uh, it's implied yeah but I wanted to hear it but go socks yes freaking Good. unbelievable last night uh, sorry uh, it looks like uh, the judge uh, got dismissed from his own case <laughs> last night. E. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hadn't pre- I hadn't prepped that. You need one. to workshop that. Bit, right, I got to work that one out. But he, he got thrown out of home, so uh, judge judge got this bad. <laughs> um, 
That's <laughs> better. Oh, thanks. I'll work on that. I'll work on those. But my point being that I came in this morning and I was in a a, a good mood, a very good mood. And the more I think about the what seems to be a complete absence of strategy on this debt ceiling thing. I mean, look, you know, there are Democrats can't control these things necessarily. Wait, wait, no, I should say they can't control what the Republicans do. Completely predictable what Mitch McConnell was going to do in terms of the debt ceiling for two reasons. One, because we have years and years of evidence of what, how Mitch McConnell does things. And the other piece of evidence was that as early as like six months ago, Mitch McConnell was making it absolutely clear, we're not going to vote to raise the debt ceiling, period, end of story. We're not going, the Democrats are going to have to do it on their own. Now, you would think at that moment, people who are in the leadership of the Democratic Party, specifically in the Senate, where this has, where, where this is a problem. Mitch McConnell says he's not going to vote for it. That's a problem in the Senate because there's a filibuster. You would think that the leader of the Democrats in the Senate would just take, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, maybe have one or two of his aides around and say like, what's the plan for this? Should we come up with a plan? Let's write down the plan. Then let's try and execute the plan. There seems to be a complete absence of a plan here. And it's coming soon, the deadline. The United States is going to default on its debt if nothing is done. It'll, the debt will break the statutory ceiling on the 18th. So, uh, and, and that's like not, if they don't get reconciliation, proce the process of reconciliation started yesterday or today at the very least, that's not going to happen through reconciliation. And the thing is, it could but they're choosing not to do this for whatever reason. Somehow they think this is, I don't even know the constituency that they think is, that, that, that it's going to have any political resonance with anybody. Hypocrisy shaming Mitch McConnell on the debt ceiling, right? Like, oh, you raised it this trillion under Trump and we helped you and now you won't raise it now and the collective... Uh, populace in the United States is going to sleep. I don't even think the people who are really the most sensitive to this issue even like, you know, yeah. they're, they're like, well, just go and, and admit the coin or do reconciliation. Yeah. But, but Joe Biden and the Democrats are, um, it's, it does not, it, it, it seems that it's not enough for them to, um, to, quixotically try and score points off of Mitch McConnell being Mitch McConnell. Now it seems that they want to basically also shoot themselves in the foot with their own uh, party. Here is uh, Joe Biden yesterday answering questions from the uh, South Lawn of the White House. And this is, it's not just Joe Biden. I mean, there's apparently talk about this in, and I don't understand. I don't, I mean, I don't understand what it is they're trying to communicate here. Here is uh, Joe Biden. Is it in a reconciliation bill? Are you okay if progressives want it in there, but Joe Manchin has said he does not want it in there? I want to get the bill passed. So how would you sign it if the Hyde Amendment is in I'd sign it either way, what? because the Hyde Amendment is anyway. What do you think is going to cut from the final bill now that there's this agreed upon? Oh, uh, I'm not sure yet. We're not over. It's not finished yet. Are Democrats considering using a nuclear option to raise the debt limit? Using a carve out with the filibuster to raise the debt limit? Oh, I think that's a real possibility. Mr. President, are you meeting with other groups of lawmakers this week? Will you be meeting with more lawmakers, with more yes. Democrats? I'll be on the phone, so this is no need to hear anymore. And that's the part that I want to hear. Are Democrats contemplating a carve out of the filibuster to raise the debt ceiling? 
And Joe Biden's response isn't, we could never do that. The filibuster is sacrosanct. I got to check with the legal experts. About we got, I'm not sure what the, can we do that? I don't think so. Because, hey, come on, man. It's the Senate. We don't do that. It's sacrosanct. Mm, never mind. You can't ruin anyway. the, you can't ruin the, the, the norms. I mean, the, think about what's communicated here. What's communicated here is, despite the fact that we have other vehicles to raise the debt ceiling, including a new reconciliation bill, the existing reconciliation bill, the minting of a multi-trillion dollar coin or a trillion dollar platinum coin, which is, you know, sort of it's sort of half a joke, but you can do it. But what it does is it illustrates that this is all made up anyways. Well, the whole thing's a joke. Exactly. Like, even the stuff that's treated with artificial seriousness is a joke. The, the existence of the debt ceiling in and of itself is also... Reconciliation is a joke. The filibuster's a joke. Well, I, I, I don't... I, I'm talking about the fiat currency. I mean, reconciliation Fine, yeah. is a mechanism that they've developed, whatever. They want to buy into that. The filibuster is a mechanism that they have. But the idea that we don't have the capacity to deal with this in other ways is a complete fiction. And, and I understand why they don't want to, why they don't want to do this. They don't want to show that there aren't the constraints that are used as a justification for not spending on other things. I mean, what would Joe Manchin say right now if everyone knew what the reality was, which is that we are not constrained by the deficit we are not constrained by the debt the debt is a is just on a balance sheet there is nobody out there who's going to come and repossess our country it just doesn't that's not the way it works we have a fiat currency but the point is is that if they are willing to get rid of the filibuster to protect that fiction but they're not willing to do it to allow people to have the right to vote, to reestablish the Voting Rights Act, which has been hacked at by the Supreme Court, that they're not, um, they, they can't touch the filibuster to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. They can't touch the filibuster uh, to, uh, to deal with immigration. They can't touch the filibuster to deal with expansion of Medicaid, the expansion of Medicare. Pro Act. The, the Pro Act. Police I reform. Mean, which police reform. On. I mean, we can go on and on and on that they are saying that protecting this fiction about our debt and there's a reason why this vote has been pro forma in the past is because it's not real. It is a artificial construct to create a false idea of scarcity so that we cannot provide for our people in this country. And McConnell is banking on their adherence to that fiction, right? Because he wants to tank the Biden presidency and Biden agenda. And what would what would happen if the United States were to default on its debt, right? The value of U.S. Treasury bonds would completely just sink, which would tank the global economy, including the U.S. economy. There's estimates that unemployment would immediately rise uh, by double what it is at right now. There's a variety of factors that would play entirely into the Republicans' hands electorally. So, like, this is actually an existential question for the Democrats, though. These these kinds of Democrats who are obsessed with process and everything that you're saying and maintaining a fiction, are you more committed to maintaining that fiction than you are to saving your own ass? Yeah, but the thing is, there is not going to be any default. That's the thing, is that there's too many other mechanisms that they can use. I mean, I if they haven't figured this out by October 18th, they're also the Treasury's going to come out and go like, you know, we actually found another thing that we can do, and another extraordinary measure, and we can do this to do October 25th. I know, but my point is that this is the kind of pr pr prospect and something that Democrats would actually be genuinely worried about that McConnell is using as leverage. I, I'm not sure exactly what McConnell's agenda is other than just like create havoc and watch these inept 
um, politicians try and do something with it. I think he just realizes like he is playing against the Washington generals. And so it really doesn't matter what he does because they're going to they're going to bump into each other. They're going to, you know, uh, end up spraining all their ankles on the court. He doesn't have to do anything. He just has to cause a problem and watch how ineptly they deal with this, because Joe Biden saying that they can get rid of the filibuster all of a sudden that it's a real prospect. Does he not realize that he's been treating this like it was, uh, you know, the the inevitable the 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 shroud the shroud of Turin or whatever it is like that oh, he did oh, something thought, like yeah, the that, the, that the filibuster is some untouchable um uh, I, I mean to just sort of like for them to be bandering it around when there's clearly other mechanisms in which to deal with 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 the debt ceiling unlike voting rights unlike immigration reform unlike on and on and on all of these priorities the pro act whatever it is and there it's they, they don't realize like the, they're politicians they, they, this is this is political and it's almost as if they're like oh well, they're playing they, it's it's almost they think they have an audience of like 15 people it's really sort of stunning i mean a measure of of incompetence it really is just crazy um and I mean, I hope they get rid of the filibuster for the debt ceiling. And then I hope they get rid of it for other things. But I'm not convinced that, that Mitch McConnell's out there going like, I'm going to force them to get rid of the filibuster. And um, I don't have to worry about it because Joe Manchin's already promised us that he's not going to vote for anything that they want. And we're going to take the Senate in uh, 16 months. And we'll have no filibuster. We'll be able to blame, uh, you know, Joe Biden for getting rid of it. And, and and the idea that people are going to say, well, we had to because of the debt ceiling. This is going to be a joke. No one will care. No one's going to care. Yeah. I'd still support Biden getting rid of it to the extent he does, though. I I say get comes. rid of it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I say get rid Not of it. Not a carve out. And if this, can, if this provides a slippery slope to getting rid of the fil- filibuster, we... even if it ends up being used or the absence of the filibuster being used by Mitch McConnell in a Republican Senate in two years, good. The American public needs to, like, there needs to be less mystification yep. around all of people's positions so that it can be quite clear as to who people are voting for. Although Republicans, they take the Senate, they get rid of the filibuster, and then before the uh, next midterms, they reinstate it. I mean, <laughs> that's that's why Democrats. No, that's when Chris Coons. Now. That's when Chris Coons announces if we retake the Senate, the first thing we're going to do is uh, reinstate the filibuster and try and get back to norms. All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to uh, Mark Joseph Stern about some of the uh, key Supreme Court cases that are coming up. Folks, today's show sponsored by one of my favorite sponsors. Last night, I gave a gift. I mean, it's not a big gift. It was like, you know, uh, a friend of mine was going on a, a, a trip and there was a little bit of anxiety associated with that trip. And I was like, take this bottle of 750 uh, milligram CBD CBD. tincture. Um, I got, and we got this tincture right here. That's the one melatonin. Right. I know. I use that to sleep. Yes. I was going to say, don't be the one to do that during no, the show. No, I'm, I'm bringing it home. Um sunsetlakecbd.com as uh, I forgot my other sign um, has uh, tinctures has salves with arnica has hand lotion has fantastic coffee it's my weekend brew that has uh, CBD in it fudge gummies smokables Matt's holding on to a big thing of Keef that apparently he's going to put into his coffee. Is that what you do? Uh, that's not what I'm doing with it, but that's what they suggested. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is they 100% pesticide free. They use integrated pest management, uh, organic grown. You can check their website. They give you every time you uh, you purchase your product, you can find out exactly what its contents are. It's been tested by third party. They work with the University of Vermont. Their their agriculture practices are um, are scrupulously designed to protect the environment and to protect the soil. 
They have great business practices, $15 minimum wage. Most of the company is employee owned. They are great movement partners, contributed not only to our uh, Afghan uh, refugee uh, drive the other day, I guess a couple of weeks ago now. They've supported the Worcester uh, nurses on strike, uh, things around their community. It is a great company and it's a great product. I, I certainly was, and Matt was, Sebede skeptics. And I have to say, I rely on it to sleep occasionally, like at the end of the night, just sort of like as a, oh, maybe we'll try one of the smokables. Um, it, uh, it really is a great product, and we've gotten so much uh, uh, great feedback and so many return customers yeah. to uh, their site. And that is what makes me, um, uh, that makes me happy because it, well, it means a lot that of people are appreciated. Stuff you can just get at the corner store for, for Sebede is not the, not, sometimes it's just not good. It's not good. You just you're, you're, most of the time it's not. Honestly, you got to source it well. I think so. And uh, if you head over to uh, sunsetlakesabade.com, use the coupon code Left is Best. Left is Best. One word. Left is Best. You get twenty percent off. Check it out right now. Go to sunsetlakesabade.com, and uh, Left is Best gets you twenty uh, percent off. Thank you for their sponsorship. Okay, want to welcome uh, back to the program, staff writer at Slate.com, Mark Joseph Stern. Mark, welcome. I'm here with Emma Vigland. Hi, Sam. Hi, Emma. Happy to be back. Hi, Mark. So, okay, new term, Supreme Court. This is um, dramatically different than, I think, like really any term that we've had maybe in the past 20 years, um, because we have a really clear, there is no, sw to the extent that there's a swing vote, I guess always hypothetically there is a swing vote, but a swing vote really doesn't matter uh, for the large part, right? Like we have 6-3, and it, I don't think it's been like this at least in 20 years. Uh, not really since the 1930s, actually, when the Supreme Court uh, repeatedly struck down New Deal legislation uh, that FDR had passed. Uh, not since then has there been a six justice conservative majority on the court. And um, the, you're right that there is no swing vote. The term I like to use is median justice. So if you line them all up by ideology, Justice Brett Kavanaugh would be the median justice. He is the sort of moderate though not moderate, justice who holds a lot of the power because now Chief Justice Roberts might as well be one of the liberals. He's been sidelined and his vote doesn't matter that much anymore. That's an insane uh, It's that. terrifying. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, and, you know, I, 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 right now, it, it seems to me, with what Breyer is is doing, the, the prospect of a 7-2 court um, seems almost as likely as maintaining a 6-3 court at this point. Yeah, so I think if um, if a Democratic senator from a red state got hit by a car tomorrow and the Senate flipped into Republican hands uh, and Breyer retired at the end of this term, I would put a lot of money on Mitch McConnell not allowing Joe Biden to fill that seat. Um, I, I, I genuinely do not believe that a Republican controlled Senate will ever again allow a Democratic president to appoint either Supreme Court justices or federal appeals court judges, which was the rule that uh, McConnell essentially established in Obama's last two years. Um, so the possibility of a 7-2 uh, court is, is not remote and the prospect should be very chilling to us all. And we should say, like, I mean, I don't know how, like, any future um, uh, Republican leader in the Senate could could actually allow it being judged against McConnell's standard, right? Because honestly, like, uh, they'll they'll get torn to shreds by um, you know AM talk radio and Fox and OWN and whatever it is. I mean, um, all right, let's. So with that uh, horrific uh, sort of baseline to start with, um, let's talk about some of the the, the major cases. 
um, that are going to come up in front of the court. Uh, I'm thinking we've got uh, Roe v. Wade uh, is on it. We have um, a, a, ma a major Second Amendment law that, uh, or I should say, a ruling. Um, and there's also a, a challenge to Chevron that is potentially there, the Chevron doctrine. You choose the order in which you want to talk about those, uh, because, I, I mean, I guess Roe v. Wade is the, almost the one that's most obvious on the block. Yeah, I think this term will probably be remembered as the term that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Um, there's a, a case arising out of Mississippi that is a challenge to the state's 15-week abortion ban. Uh, and the state of Mississippi actually brought this case to the Supreme Court saying, hey, we just want to move back the line where when states can ban abortion. Right now it's at viability, which is about 24 weeks. Mississippi said, we just want to move it back to 15 weeks. The Supreme Court took up the case and then Mississippi came back and said, ignore what we said before. Never mind. Now we just want you to overturn Roe v. Wade so we can ban abortion outright and, and every other state that wants to can ban abortion. And I think that will prove to be a successful strategy. Um, you know, Chief Justice Roberts seems to be a swing vote on abortion. But like we were saying earlier, his vote doesn't really matter, right? Brett Kavanaugh is the one who matters here. Um, and he has never voted to block an abortion restriction in, in his career. To the contrary, he auditioned for the Supreme Court uh, by continually voting to force a pregnant undocumented minor uh, to carry her unwanted pregnancy to term in a shelter in Texas. Um, he is very, very anti-abortion. And I do think that he will cast the fifth vote uh, to abolish the viability rule established in row, allow Mississippi to implement this 15-week ban, and in the process, effectively, if not formally, overturn row by saying, you know, there's no viability line anymore. States can declare open season on abortion, not just 15 weeks, but 12, 8, 6, 0, uh, pretty much within weeks or months of, of a decision. I think we'll see about half the states in the country banning abortion at least after 12 weeks, if not earlier. All right. So just to be clear, I just want to back up just a little bit in terms of like what Roe effectively says. Mm -hmm. And that basically says that you that abortion cannot be banned prior to 22, uh, 24 weeks uh, yes. uh, from. And, and, and how I mean, is that is that determined like who, who makes that determination that 24 weeks? So the scientific community um, and the medical community have sort of settled on 24 weeks as the, the, the baseline for when a fetus can survive outside the womb with extreme medical intervention, of course. Um, and there are very rare cases of uh, very, very premature uh, babies surviving at that point. But the reality is that many, if not most, uh, pregnancies that are delivered at 24 weeks that they're not going to survive. Nonetheless, that is considered to be the kind of starting point of potential viability. And how is the, uh, in, in an individual's instance, what are the mechanisms in which the state would be aware? And this is coming into play in the context of, of, of Texas right now, and it would conceivably come into context, you know, 15 weeks out. Um, what, what is the mechanism in which the state is aware that someone has had an abortion prior to or following 24 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever it is? Like, I mean, what is the mechanics of that? Um, do you mean like forcing them to go to a doctor and having them examined or something like that? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, like uh, the, the doctor must testify as to and certify that it's 24 weeks as opposed to 23 and a half or, you know, six weeks as opposed to this. Like, I mean, how, how exactly does that work? Because I want people to have a notion of just like how intrusive this is going to be. When we hear so much about we don't want to get between a doctor and their patient, this is like we're, we're going to have the, this is exactly what this is. Right. Right. So the first thing to note here is that there are actually a lot of states that currently ban abortion before viability and reproductive rights advocates are too scared of the Supreme Court to challenge them. But a number of states, including Texas, already ban abortion at 20 weeks, which is before viability uh, in every state with these severe abortion restrictions. Um, there are ultrasound requirements and putatively these ultrasounds are supposed to help to confirm that the pregnancy is still at an, a stage that is early enough to be legal. Uh, also, they are designed to force the patient uh, to try to change her mind. In some states, the doctor is required to amplify the noises of the fetus 
uh, really loud so that the woman cannot drown them out by covering her ears or making noises. So the woman has to sit there and listen to the sounds of a fetus. And those sounds are usually obtained with a transvaginal ultrasound. A traditional ultrasound isn't going to get that amount of detail. So it's really a probe inserted into the patient's vagina. And then she's forced to sit there and watch and listen as the sounds and images of her pre-viability pregnancy are blasted to her. And we should be clear that when we're talking about, you know, at least in Texas, we're talking about the supposed uh, fetal heartbeat at six weeks. It is not a fetus. It is still an embryo. There is no heartbeat because there is no heart at that point. There is a sort of like the beginnings of a formation of like an intersection <laughs> essentially in the body. And what it is, it's a it is an interpretation of this machine of electrical impulses. You cannot hear it with a na with a naked uh, ear, even if you were somehow to put your you know head inside of you know someone's stomach and, and put it up there. There there is no heartbeat. Right, and um, there's there's this line in a lot of anti-abortion briefs and arguments and legislation that we've had so many scientific developments since 1973, since Roe was decided, um, that we now know that fetuses are real people, that they they develop really early, that they're capable of pain at very early weeks, um, and so because of that, the factual underpinnings of Roe have fallen and it has to be overturned. But that's really almost entirely nonsense. Uh, it's not true that we can scientifically determine whether a fetus is a human, right? And, and like you say, what anti-abortion advocates describe as human organs, things like a heart, are not recognizable in a six-week fetus or, or even long thereafter. A fetus in early development has just the rudimentary beginnings of what's going to become a full-fledged body. Um, and so when, when Texas uses language like a heartbeat act, it's really a, a sleight of hand, uh, kind of akin to the billboards I always saw growing up in Florida that said, my heartbeat begins at six weeks, don't kill me with a picture of a fetus that was at least at 12 weeks. So you mentioned that, you know, you, you believe that the Supreme Court is essentially going to whittle this down or do something that will effectively end abortion as the protections um, were laid out in row. I, I'm wondering what you predict those contours will be, because obviously what we're seeing in Texas is seen as the most extreme, but a lot of states are taking notes. And we're talking about a six-week viability. Most women don't even know they're pregnant after six weeks, so it's an impossible standard, and it's nearly an entire ban. Um, you know, they could try to... Not, no pun intended, split the baby in many ways, but essentially uh, end abortion. There, there are a variety of ways they could go. I'd imagine they'd try to appear less extreme um, while still doing what they want to do ideologically. So that's a real possibility. And you can imagine the Supreme Court saying, OK, we're moving back the line to, to 15 weeks. So Mississippi's law can stand, but Texas's law has to fall. But I don't think that the justices are going to do that, um, because really, once you've erased the viability line, it's hard to identify a clear factual and legal standard that cordons off some some abortions as lawful and constitutional and the rest as able to be banned. Uh, the reason the court landed on viability and stuck to it for almost half a century is because it's relatively clear. Um, and, and I don't see the five ultra conservative justices um, taking all of the heat that they would take for eroding Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, throwing the court's legitimacy into real question, setting off a, a political firestorm just to move the line back Back a few weeks. Uh, it doesn't seem to me like there's any appetite for that. And you see this reflected in almost all of the briefs on the anti-abortion side. Um, in, in some cases where conservatives are looking for a win, you see a, a whole range of possibilities laid out in briefs where they say, well, you could do this or this or this. There's a more moderate option. There's a more extreme option. But here, all of the anti-abortion folks are singing the same tune. They say, don't just fiddle with the standard, just overturn Roe, because once you start fiddling with it, the whole thing collapses anyway. And, and I think that there's some logical consistency there that will be very appealing to the conservative majority. All right, let's move on to um, to another case that is that has the potential for impacting all sorts of other cases. Um, and this deals with the... Um, what is known as Chevron deference. 
Um, and the case is American Hospital Association versus Becerra. Will you, will you tell us the broad sort of like facts in that case? And then we'll talk about the potential it has for impacting the Chevron doctrine. Um, yeah. So first, I think we should just briefly explain what Chevron deference is, right? Okay. Um, because it's important uh, to, to drill down on those details as crazy and boring as it sounds to most people who think it's like a, a car commercial. If anybody is listening to this show who thinks it's crazy and boring, I want them to leave now. And <laughs> okay, good. Um, so so here's, here's what happens with our modern American political system. Congress is filled with non-experts who, when they manage to pass a law, do not generally put a lot of details in the law. For instance, when Congress passed the Clean Air Act, Congress didn't say you can have this many parts per million of mercury in air. Congress said, all right, EPA, you now have the job of determining how much mercury in the air is safe and then implementing regulations to keep us at or below that limit, right? And when the EPA responds with some kind of regulation, uh, the courts will inevitably review it because companies like Chevron are going to challenge it. And the question then becomes, how much deference should the federal courts give to these agencies that are interpreting laws that are really broad and often genuinely ambiguous? And if you say that courts should give a lot of deference, then you're giving these agencies a lot of leeway to decide what they think is best in their experts' view. If you give them not a lot of deference, then you're basically saying that Congress has been legislating wrong for the last century, and that a ton of legislation, including the Clean Air Act, is uh, just unenforceable because it's too vague. So moving back to, oh yeah, Sam. Let me ask you one more question in terms of like, so we have the, 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 the Chevron deference, and this comes out of this uh, Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council. This is yes. from a case in the 80s, um, which essentially says that the courts must defer to the expertise of the EPA, the the FDA, the whatever the agency is. What, what's the difference between that and the the delegation um, uh, uh, doctrine, like the idea, the non delegation doctrine? I mean, like there, there's a subtle difference between these two. Yeah, so they're fundamentally intertwined, um, but you can think of Chevron deference as more of an issue with just statutory interpretation. Here are the words, what do they mean? Uh, and you can think of non-delegation as a broader constitutional idea. Um, wh whatever the words mean, does the Constitution allow that? And so the, the idea behind non-delegation is that Congress cannot under the Constitution, give agencies a lot of leeway to interpret and enforce broad legislation because that involves delegating the legislative power uh, to these agencies that are part of the executive branch. So people like Neil Gorsuch say, you know what? When Congress wants to keep mercury out of the air, Congress has got to say exactly how many parts per million uh, we're allowed to have, and it has got to say exactly how we're going to enforce that. Congress can't just kick it to the EPA because because the job of legislating is falls only to Congress and administrative agencies don't get to do it. So even if we applied Chevron deference, it doesn't matter because this delegation is unconstitutional. Okay, and so just to be clear, the Chevron deference is the relationship between the court and the agency right. on some level, and the non-delegation principle is the court assessing the relationship between uh, Congress and the agency. Yes. And, and we should say, like, you know, people should just sit with this for a moment because we don't know like when you test your water for instance if you have a well you don't say the the testing company has a list of 12 known um maybe it's more than that but 12 known carcinogens or toxins that could be in your water there's no way to say, like, look for blankety blank, which we don't know because maybe there's some fracker down the road that's pumping stuff in there that's a trade secret. We don't even know what it is. Like, there's no way for Congress to ever not delegate. And if you are essentially delegating the authority to people who are, have been assembled to be experts, who should have the deference in that moment, the experts or the court? when it just comes to the actual sort of like material scientific questions and that's what is going on here there's no way to do it any other way is my point and yet we're looking at the end of that ability for lawmakers to use 
Yes, and so this is a case, that, to, to go back to this case on the docket right now, uh, American Hospital Association, uh, the, I, I think right now it's Becerra. Um, this is a very confusing and boring and technical case about reimbursement rates paid by Medicare for particular outpatient drugs uh, and exactly how that reimbursement rate is set. And so the question is whether HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, can have its expert look at all of the facts and look at the statutory language and figure out what the right reimbursement rate is and have some, some respect for that in the courts or whether the Supreme Court justices should take out their calculators and their pencils and decide that for HHS and say whether or not they got it right. And I just want to add one more layer on top of what you were saying earlier. Um, federal courts are accountable to no one, and we're learning that now in a very brutal way, right? Uh, conservatives like to say that agencies are accountable to no one as well, that they're unelected bureaucrats. That's not really true. Um, agencies are created by Congress. Congress can easily pass new legislation to rein them in or abolish them or change them. And their leaders are appointed by the president and generally confirmed by the Senate. When the president leaves, agency personnel changes over. The new guy comes in. He gets to put his people in. They get to enforce the rules and change the rules if they want to. So no, agencies aren't the most democratic feature of our system, but they are much more accountable to the actual people, the voters, than federal judges who want to sit there with their calculators and their pencils and say what the real rule should be. Okay, so putting aside the intricacies of the Medicare reimbursement rates, because this is the 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 real issue in this case is going to be not so much what the Medicare reimbursement rates are, but whether the agency tasks with establishing those has the right to establish those. And then that principle, if that is if they find that the agency doesn't have the right to do that, it is we are off to the races. Will you just like give us a sense of like what that means in a material, tangible way? I mean, we could lose. Uh, I mean, theoretically, it seems to me we could lose our entire regulatory state for the most part. All of it, all of it. And this has always been the goal, right? The goal of the non-delegation people and the anti-Chevron deference people is not to like nibble around the edges of a, of a small set of regulations. It's to tear down the administrative state. And you see this in writings of, again, justices like Neil Gorsuch, who cares a lot about this, where he he just openly smears these agencies and their personnel as like beady-eyed bureaucrats in the basement of government buildings doing unaccountable work. So, you know, go back to my mercury example. The EPA doesn't get any more deference there. Then we could see mercury rates shoot up and the EPA will be powerless to stop it. And so will Congress, unless we abolish the filibuster, which we're not going to, right? Um, think about... Definitely. Okay, okay. But, you know, if we can sneak a mercury rider into the debt ceiling legislation, it would make me happier. Um, think about overtime standards, basic fair labor stuff uh, that's that's implemented by the Department of Labor. All of that is Chevron deference, right? All of that is delegated. Each new president comes in, puts their people in Department of Labor, and they figure out what's fair. Uh, same deal with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, rules about payday lending. Um, same deal with every agency you can think of, the Department of Education, when it's trying to stop sexual assaults on campus when it's trying to do set minimal standards. Uh, think about, you know, I, I could just go down the list of agencies, the Department of Energy, the Department of Commerce. These agencies exert immense influence over our lives, interpreting really broad statutes that are designed to give them leeway. And if those statutes are sort of ripped out from under them, if the carpet is pulled out from under these agencies, they won't be able to do anything. And the federal regulatory structure will collapse on itself. I mean, I, you know, that, that's why like these type of cases uh, to me are are so crucial for people to understand. And they are so um, obscured in many ways. Right. I mean, like, you know, you're, you're explaining this to us and you're feeling like you have to apologize. <laughs> Yet it is what like 
make sure that we have, you know, some constraints on what happens in meat processing plants so that we're not getting, you know, if you haven't said specifically what type of animal feces we want to keep out of there, you know, well, you know, the Congress never said orangutan feces and uh, just didn't contemplate that there could be go back and fix it. I mean, right. the, um, uh, th this is going to affect our health our safety, it's going to affect our workers' rights, it's going to affect our consumer rights, it's going to affect um, uh, our ability to, uh, I don't know, have Medicare not pay uh, exorbitant rates for, for, for things. I mean, this is, this is going to affect every aspect of our lives, and it's going to be completely obscured from your average American. People don't understand it. Uh, you need to, to kind of understand this baseline legalese where it's like non-delegation just to wrap your head around what's going on. And I think that's the genius of this particular conservative crusade. Uh, it's, it's hard for normal people to understand. And so they can't make the connection between federal judges and their food poisoning that they got because OSHA wasn't allowed to regulate their, their workplace sandwiches anymore. Um, and it's an issue, It's it might be an issue with the, the vaccine mandate as well. OSHA is interpreting a really broad statute that gives it sweeping authority uh, to implement these kind of workplace safety rules. We don't know if the courts will grant it deference. If not, that, that vaccine mandate may fall. Um. And it's really just, I mean, is this the only case that they have on the docket as of yet to address this? I mean, when when they start, there, and, and there's been cases in the past, at least in the recent past, where there's been dicta, at least, that has sort of hinted at various of the ones of these conservative justices having a skepticism to this idea that, like, we can have almost an administrative state that has any type of um i guess role in making granular decisions yes. and, and and so like how do you expect this to go like it, it, let me put it this way it seems impossible to me short of a couple of people getting hit by a bus that the chevron uh, deference or the non-delegation uh, authority is going to be in existence let's say four years from now I, but it could come six weeks from now. It could come, right? I mean, like, how do you anticipate them going about this? Are they going to slice and dice this, or are they just going to hack it off like you're assuming they're, they're going to do with Roe v. Wade? So I feel professionally obligated to say I don't want anyone getting hit by a bus. We're just talking law here. But, uh, you know, the, it's a hypothetical. <laughs> the way, the way, right, just a hypothetical. But the, the way that I think it will work is that the court will refuse to grant Chevron deference in this particular case and come up with some reasons that are silly, but give it an excuse, and then add a bunch of language dicta that is non-binding, but that says, by the way, the signatories of this opinion think that Chevron deference is bad and in, a, in an appropriate case should be overruled. That gives the high sign to conservative litigators who are pressing a bunch of Chevron related cases in the lower courts right now. You see a flood of cert petitions rise up to the Supreme Court and then the justices take their pick. They use one as a vehicle to overturn Chevron deference and by June of 2023, it's gone completely. It's, uh, it, I mean, this is, it, it, it's so twisted, but it's basically, they're going to use these uh, cases to basically hone in on what should be brought to them and what the, the pivotal sort of issues in the fulcrum of that decision will be so that we can really knock this out. They're basically saying, this is, this is the target we need. We need it right. this size. We need these colors in it, and we need to be this far away from it when we, you know, uh, when we aim and fire. And that's basically. And then when they do overturn it, they say, well, what are you guys complaining about? If you're angry about this, we've warned you we were going to do this for years. You know, we've been crapping on Chevron deference in our opinions forever. And the gaslighting continues. All right. Let's talk about um, uh, gun control. Um, we should say that for the vast majority of this country's history, I mean, it's even almost understating it, up until 2008, the Supreme Court had observed, I think starting from like the 1930s, I think it was, essentially that, um, the, that the Second Amendment was about militias. And then in 2008, I think it was in the Heller case, 
um, sort of, oh, I don't know, 180, uh, 45 degree, 90. I don't know what the degrees would be. But no, this is about the right for individuals to carry. And what is happening with New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin? So for 13 years, since Heller came down in 2008, um, pro-gun advocates have wanted to expand that decision to guarantee a right to carry guns in public. Uh, Heller's language is actually fairly limited. The phrase in the home is repeated throughout. The, the court says, the Second Amendment confers an individual right to keep a handgun in the home. Uh, and so lower courts have generally, though not always held, um, that you don't have a right to take that gun out of the home and carry it with you on the streets. This will be the case to hold that. Uh, for a long time, when Kennedy and then Roberts were the swing votes, the court turned away these cases. But now that Kavanaugh is the median vote, uh, and Kavanaugh is very, very pro-gun, uh, the court has taken up this case. And it seems very likely that the court will essentially strike down down New York's prohibition on concealed carry require the state to license anyone who wants to carry a, a concealed weapon in public to do so as long as they don't have a criminal record. And in the process, also strike down laws in, um, uh, I think, about nine other states, including California, that currently prohibit or strictly limit concealed carry of weapons in public. I mean... Super excited, super excited to have a, a lot of armed people walking around in New York City. You know, it's unfortunate for many reasons, uh, but one is that some public defenders have actually joined this case and sided against the state and, and with the gun owners. Uh, um, and it caused a little bit of a stir. And they argue that this law allows New York police officers um, to harass and intimidate racial minorities on the suspicion that they're carrying a firearm. Uh, I guess two points I wanna make about that. First, the police will continue to do that because it's the NYPD and the police face no <laughs> real consequences. But second, um, you know, there are a lot of studies that show that New York's law is working to save lives, and in particular, working to save Black lives. There is a study that shows that New York's concealed carry ban um, lowers the death rate, the fatality rate among adult Black men in the state. And so I, I think it's unfortunate that this is being pitted as a kind of racial justice uh, issue by the public defenders when there are definitely at least two sides to it, right? I mean, I mean even if the law is allowing police brutality, which is bad and should not happen, um, it's also saving lives. And I'm not sure that the answer to that is just to have unelected judges step in and rule for one side and withdraw from the state the ability to limit concealed carry. Yeah, it is. Um, I've I've um, uh, I, I've looked into that, and it's really vexing and uh, disturbing in that re regard. And and um, I I don't know. I it seems to me like that's a pretty that the, uh, it, it's hard to imagine that the, this court not essentially blowing out any of these these restrictions on 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 carrying in public. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's the direction we're headed. And I think if it's concealed carry this time, it'll be open carry next time. There's a case coming out of the Ninth Circuit where all of the conservatives said that you have a constitutional right to publicly carry a, a weapon in public where everyone can see it, uh, including an assault rifle. God, it is going to be so messed up to walk down the streets of New York City. Uh, and, you know, uh, every now and then, I'm, I'm I'm hoping is there any hope here or are we like we're we're talking about like scenarios that until you know we we talk this through I hadn't necessarily begun to contemplate um I mean I think there's a general consensus that this court is going to grant a constitutional right to concealed carry um I I think the only question after that is whether they extend it to like open carry uh, I suppose we could see Kavanaugh changing his mind because he doesn't want his kids to see AR-15s when they're shopping at Kroger. Um, but I, I have to say, like, this was what Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump were doing all of those years when they weren't passing any legislation, right? They, they passed one major bill under Trump. They passed a tax cut bill. What were they doing all the rest of the time? appointing and confirming judges, because they knew that those judges would implement the GOP policies that are too unpopular to pass legislatively. Republicans have been pushing a nationwide concealed carry bill for years. It has never gotten the, the requisite number of votes. It's not very popular legislation, but that doesn't matter anymore because 
Trump was able to put these Federalist Society judges on the bench, Senate Republicans confirmed them, and now they're just going to implement that bill that was too unpopular to pass democratically. Um, it's something that many of us were screaming about, I know, including the majority report during, uh, during Trump's tenure. And I guess the only real solution, Emma, is something like court expansion and court reform that dilutes the impact of these very, very far right Republican appointed justices. Um, there are other cases, but I think those are the three, at least the, the, the most prominent, and we'll have you back on to talk others. But let me, I, I want to ask you this question, and, and, and the Biden administration, from my understand, is a lot more attuned to this problem than the Obama administration was, and is, is putting as many courts, uh, many justices on the court uh, as they can at this point. Um, there's a limited amount you can because there's not as many vacancies as there was during um, going into the Trump administration. Um, and the Democrats may not control the Senate in, in, in I guess, 12 months, uh, 14 months. Um, but what is there a dynamic that's going on with all the federal judges that Trump was able to appoint? Circuit judges, I mean, in the appellate courts. Um, and maybe I guess even in the uh, in the district courts, that um, the the path to these cases for the Supreme Court, the route to there is just easier than it has been in the past. Like like, will you just explain? We just have a couple minutes. Will you just explain that dynamic? Because people just assume that these cases come up in the course of you know life, but that's not the way it works with these. Yeah, and I think that the abortion case this term is a great example. This is a 15-week ban. Should, the, the Court of Appeals should have issued a one-page decision saying this violates Roe, therefore it is blocked. Uh, instead, Judge James Ho, who is arguably Trump's single worst judicial nominee across all of the courts, uh, decided to write this opinion that demanded that the Supreme Court use this case to overturn Roe v. Wade, wrote essentially his own brief, like he was an advocate, lobbying the conservative justices to seize on this case to overturn Roe. And that gives conservative lawyers so much power uh, because they can take that and put it front and center in their, in their appeal to the Supreme Court and say, look, the lower courts are desperate for you to take this case. They have sent the clearest smoke signal that they can. And this is happening all around. You are seeing uh, conservative Trump judges writing opinions against against, say, trans rights, against environmental regulations, against uh, LGBTQ equality and more other contexts and all the other stuff we've been talking about, where they are advocating for the Supreme Court to overturn precedent and rule for them and use this particular case to do it. And I think that does create a dynamic where those cases go to the very top of the pile. They get attention at the Supreme Court and the conservative majority looks at them and is looks at them very favorably. Uh, you never had that dynamic with liberal Liberals ever. They just don't act like that. I mean, we shouldn't even call them liberal judges, right? They're, the, the, our liberal judges are basically centrist judges. How many judges used to be across the political spectrum? These guys are a new breed, and they are not shy about using all of their power and influence to try to rocket very controversial cases straight up to SCOTUS. Mark Joseph Stern, um, thank you. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I felt my Sorry to be the harbinger of doom once again, uh, but yeah. that's my role these days, and uh, I guess I just have to live with it. It's like uh, you know we've been you know uh, we've been seeing this train come down the tracks, and at one point it 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 ends up being right in front of your face. Um, We're gonna call you Doctor Doom for your next <laughs> your next appearance. Appreciate uh, your spending the time with us. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Mark. All right, folks, going to take a quick break. Be right back. Wrap things up.
All right. If you're watching us on Peacock, we will say adieu. Adieu. <laughs> okay. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, uh, same time, I guess. I don't know. Au revoir. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. It's underwater friends. I think I think I think uh, Mark Joseph Stern broke all our brains. I, I was trying desperately to get us a little bit of uh, a little bit of laughter. A little levity. I, I felt like I was I was saying in the uh, break. I felt like I was going to cry like two or three times. Holy moly, that was depressing. Well, uh, I don't know if uh, the Peacock people are still with us, but we'll see you tomorrow. Whoa! Right. I thought uh, we I thought we did officially I don't, break. I don't know. Yeah, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Um, and I'm sure they'll appreciate uh well, the French. Yeah. Well, well I'm cultured. I mean <laughs> don't people can't people tell I speak. Maybe they'll be uh, maybe we could put that in the tags, uh so the search terms on the Peacock app so they can just look for uh, French speaking and and get to us. <laughs> I actually took a uh 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 I don't know if I want to go into this. Do it. <laughs> I took a uh I just saw somebody um promote the the appearance that they did on uh, the other show that we do on Peacock. Mm -hmm. And they put a link up and just for shits and giggles, I knew how this was going to go. I, uh, I put on my, I saw it on Twitter and I put on my recording on my phone and I clicked the link <laughs> to see how many steps it took me to actually get to the interview that they were uh, purportedly linking to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, How many steps? Let me put it this way. It is easier for me to fill out the health screening form for my son to get into school every day, <laughs> establishing the exact exposures he's had on three different uh, uh, pages to COVID uh, to get him into school every day. That takes a couple of minutes. So, I mean, it's really, you got to really want to see that clip. Mm hmm. And then even then, there's no guarantee because it really doesn't actually take you to anything. So, whatever. That's just, you know, technology. Technology, right? They still haven't quite figured that out yet. Yeah, some... Links. Some technology is easy. Others, it's hard. Folks! I'm just, like, sort of fighting between the sort of, you know, like that we're, we're finally here at the 6-3 Supreme Court, which, you know... <sighs> Uh, Long-time listeners of this show know that, um, you know, we, we It was we never were, gonna happen. We were warning about this in the summer of, of 2016. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I say, you see the uh, train leave the station, do you're, you know, it's, you're on the plains of the, I don't know, you're in Nebraska and you could see the train leaving from miles and miles away, that smokestack. I mean, I, I guess I've, I've never seen a train with a smokestack, but I'm just imagining if back in the day, look, Ma, the train's coming. It'll be here in half a day. <laughs> like you can see it, you know what I mean? And uh, and, and it's just, you could just see it coming. Um, and and here we're, we're here now. And uh, like, you know, that, uh, it's it, it just, I... I you're ruled by fear, Sam. By the way, do you hear this crazy stuff about the vaccines? I don't know. I feel a little bit weird about it now. <laughs> God. I like how your only perception of trains are from the Lone Ranger. Well, I don't know other contexts where you see a, you can see a train from that kind of distance. You right. know what I mean? You see trains from a distance in North Dakota. Or well, North Dakota. Okay, I could have said North Dakota as opposed to Nebraska. But... You, you, you can only see the train from a distance. Like you, 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 they don't let the big smoke off anymore. Though. That's right. right. That's my point. Right. They're not the. I'm just using the analogy as a way of like, like you know, sort of like trying to mediate the reality, uh, so that it's the reality is just not that painful. Yeah. Until the reality, aka the train, hits you and runs you over. I mean, it's that it's happening. I mean, we we can see what's going on in Texas. That is just that is a brief preview uh, as to what's going to happen around the the country. I mean, they're not going to have to do those hinky dink. Um, you know, we're we're uh, we're deputizing you know lunatics uh, to use uh, civil procedure as a way of doing this. We can just do it now.
Mm. We can just do it now. We'll just, they're going to, they're going to, you know, hook up the uh, ultrasounds to the same sort of mechanism they have for um, when they do car inspections and, uh, you know, to make sure that your catalytic converter is working. I mean, that's basically it. Yeah. I mean, and it's the, the artificial noise. Well, it's not artificial, I guess, amplified noise of the, the baby in your in your uterus like i'm sure if you amplify the noise of other ways in which your organs are moving about it might not be the best it's not even an amplification best. i mean let's be clear it is i mean he said he turns it up like really really loud so women can't cover their ears that's the amplification but it's not you're not when you're at six weeks you're not hearing a noise that is coming from your body you are hearing the translation of an electrical impulse into a noise which is different it the the sound does not exist without it going through this machine it's like the beep 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 of an ekg machine but like right. oh, that's there, not your, actually, your that's heart not is your heart sounds your heart like. does not go beep 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 <laughs> that's exactly right all right uh, folks, this show relies on your support. Uh, you can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only help this show survive and thrive, but you also get extra content virtually every day. Mm. I, you know, I, I, I'm only saying virtually because I know that there's a oh, Indigenous People Day is coming up. Is it a week from yesterday? I don't know. On Monday? Monday. And so we're uh, willing to do a, uh, a first half of the show. Uh, but look at look at how scrupulous I am by that. Like, I mean, that takes like like that that the idea that we're going to be doing that one non fun half a show has been like dogging my ability to say you get extra content every day for like months. I've seen that coming because you're just anticipating the one day that there won't be extra content. Yeah. Right. You you can't you can't lie about it. One day there won't be extra content, but that doesn't mean that the extra content from the other days isn't worth a membership. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I solved that that moral yeah, quandary I, I for you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade co to coffee, tea or chocolate, use the coupon code majority get 10% off. And join our Discord, majoritydiscord.com. Subscribe and like our uh, YouTube videos. Poggers, get a uh, hype train going. Do all that stuff. Choo choo. <laughs> Are you? What's in that? What's in that thing? You know what it is on Hump Day. Yeah. <laughs> Absinthe. <laughs> oh my God. Matt, what's happening in well, the Matt Lecky in the media universe? First, I just had an image of somebody hooking up like their fetus to like an orange amplifier guitar. Amplifier. Right, exactly. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Put it through a fuzz there, pedal. That is Incidentally, that, that's actually not even a fetus. That's how Nirvana right. it's, it's recorded It's an embryo in utero. until like yeah. week 10 or 11. Put that's a, how Nirvana recorded in utero. Uh, I'll hook my, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll hook my embryo up to a Vox AC-15. Um, uh, tonight on Left Reckoning, Kale Brooks of Jacobin Video Editor uh, joined us to talk about NGOs. We'll also be talking about, uh, in the post game, Dave Rubin uh, breaks down the Facebook whistleblower in a way that I think is very instructive uh, for where we have uh, some convergence and divergence with the right on this issue. Uh, and we'll also be talking about all the right wingers coming to the defense of Christian cinema. That's uh, patreon.com just left That's weird. to get access to the post game. It is weird. Uh, it's also like one of the reasons to like like having Dems in power because these sorts of things start um, showing themselves as opposed to say Kristen Cinema acting like she's one of us. Right. Um, right. I agree. But uh, so yeah, patreon.com says so left reckoning. That's eight seven central tonight on YouTube. Also, don't forget check out uh, Nomi Show youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. You can find that at youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show or Twitch.tv Twitch. slash the, the underscore Noma Key underscore show. Wow. See you in the fun half. 646 257 3920. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they are in for it. All right, folks. 646 257 3920. See you in the fun half. <laughs> 
Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Wait, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, no, what a fucking what nightmare. A nightmare. Nightmare. Bring back nightmare. 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 Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, oh, yeah. so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are black, black. Africans are black, black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. We are back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, all right, this is weird. Um, Benito Camales. Uh Hello, guys, from the Madrid, Spain. I just became a member today. We're going to give you one of these. Like, I, I imagine the Ohio State. Yes, I would imagine um, uh, Benito is a uh, Spanish speaker. Sorry, uh, I didn't but, mean to make fun but of But the you English is actually, I mean, the, the writing is it's quite good. Thank you very much for keeping the show going. I love you all. I miss Michael. Thank you. Uh, please, Sam, can you give a show fart to my dear auntie for her birthday? Rosa Meltis, uh, Melta Oso and... Uh, her two kids, Elver Galagra, Galarga, and <laughs> Elva Galinda, and to her boyfriend, Miko Tito Gorditoy Cabezo. Thank you, and uh, keep up 100. I, I can't tell if I was just being like taken on a ride about the, but it's also not a show fart, it is a show far. <laughs> Nevertheless, I can't tell you the level of restraint that over in the 15 years I've had a soundboard that it has taken not to have a show fart. No, no, on the uh, on the on the soundboard. Yep. Um, 
but uh, I mean, I've always I've always considered that a point of pride that I never did that, and I could. It's super easy. I can assure you. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number. Um, I'm sure right wingers are going to have a problem with this as well, particularly those who are so concerned about our elite and uh, the authoritarianism. But here is a reporter um, harassing, violently harassing Kristen Cinema, who apparently feels like it's unnecessary for her to allow her constituents or the rest of the country an explanation as to why she feels that we don't deserve paid leave if we're sick or paid parental leave or universal pre-K or um, child tax credits, child tax credits, provisions, elder care, um, all of these things. Look, she's a senator. She has a right to vote against them. Why don't she tell us why or what it is that she would vote for if there's anything? But here is the... Um, Here's her being questioned, and here you mean is her harassed and abused and assaulted. And here is her answer. I'm just wondering why you feel that you don't have to say literally anything about this publicly. The people who voted for you, the people who didn't vote for you. Everyone else seems to be engaging in a public, good faith conversation. I appreciate this, but she's a, I appreciate that. Senator, and you also have our phone. I do, I do. It's a great email account. Senator, do you have any time that you feel like you should make about this? Gary, you haven't reached out to our office. Senator, do the people who've been protesting you have any effect on the way you're looking at this issue? All right, thank you, Senator. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you. Yeah, he knew he wasn't getting anything, but no, but I think it is illustrative of, of yeah. the bigger point, which is she doesn't feel and it's not like, let's be clear here. She's not communicating with anybody in Arizona. She hasn't had a town hall or anything, any type of event with with people in Arizona for, I don't know. Months and months. Ages. Yeah. Not a virtual one. Nothing. Maybe, maybe, maybe Joe Biden's lying. Maybe everybody who's coming out of these meetings saying she won't say what it is she wants or doesn't want. Maybe they're all lying. But at least Joe Manchin takes the time to shovel out some BS about inflation and uh, debt. And I think means testing is important. She can't afford to do this because there's um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars being spent on her behalf in Arizona, pretending that she's actually fighting for the things that she's obstructing. Well, to be fair to her, she she really she can't go to the bathroom in peace. She can't be on a plane in peace. She can't be at her place of work in peace here. Right. Like that. That's her office. And she's getting harassed there, too, by reporters. Do you know what it's like to get on an elevator after you've been asked a question? It's disgusting. It's horrible. I, I, yeah, but like, okay, my point being is that she, they're making all of these points about form and, and decorum. A lot of people talking about def who are defending cinema, including now mostly right-wing groups and some centrists still holding on uh, in, in defending her as well. There is no place that's better or more like in the narrow scope of what these people deem acceptable than the ha halls of, of Congress, where she should be, be answering questions by reporters and she just stands there. And she feels zero obligation to explain why she's acting in this way. And that's because the people who she really feels she should be answering to are the people that write her checks. I, I, I think the problem that she has too is that she is attempting the my understanding and 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 i and, and granted i only know this secondhand i'm not in arizona my understanding is that there are tv ads that are being deployed that make it sound like she is fighting for the things that she's literally preventing from passing 
And so if she comes out with public statements as to why she's stopping these things, it's going to undercut her ability to pretend like she's actually fighting for them. And even with that, those ads, her approval rating in one quarter of this year has taken a 13 point dip. A total nosedive. So and worse with independence. Right. I mean, it, it, if this is her posture, probably makes sense to be quiet as opposed to saying something. But I don't even, I, you know, honestly, I don't even know if that's true. Let's go to the uh, phones calling from a 423 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? My name's Jeremiah. I'm calling from Tennessee. Jeremiah from Tennessee. What is on your mind, Jeremiah? So I'm very pro-choice when it comes to the argument of abortion. And when it comes to abortion, when I'm arguing it or discussing it, and what at one point in the topic, um, the topic of adoption will come up. And online, I can't find any consistent information when it comes to adoption compared to abortion. So I wanted to know what your thoughts were as adoption being an alternative to abortion. An, an, an uh, 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 adoption being an alternative to abortion? You mean that a lot yeah. of uh, anti-abortion activists will say that you can, if you don't want the child, can give the baby up for adoption. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So and I'm talking specifically about the cases where a woman isn't taken advantage of or a case like incest. Yeah. Well, I mean, I will tell you this. I mean, I think that the 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 principle in which I think women should have a right to have an abortion is a function of them having the autonomy over their body. Now, like, like, I mean, I think like it's possible to argue, hey, you know, uh, if the concern is that abortion is traumatic for the women, which we sometimes hear, it could very well be more traumatic um, to um, carry a child to term and then um, never see it again. Um, that's possible, but that's irrelevant because ultimately, in my, my perspective, those are two separate questions. The primary question is, do women have the right to determine the trajectory of their lives? Can they be forced to carry a uh, zygote to uh, through a full term of pregnancy? And the answer in my mind is no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm not against that. adoption. Uh, if people want to uh, give their children have have a you know give birth and then um, per, you know give that child up for adoption, uh, you know uh, okay. Um, and I think people should you know adopt. I think that's great. Uh, but th they're not they're not there's no relationship in my mind to that to the question of whether a woman should have the right to choose what happens with her body and whether, you know, someone should, uh, uh, well, that's the exact point. She has the right to choose what happens with her body. Right. So you can say, I'm not against adoption as an option. If the woman decides that she wants to give a child up for adoption, she can, but forcing her to not be able to make that choice. I, I, I it, it depends on the woman, but as Sam said, uh, I, I think, having to carry a baby for nine months and then giving up that baby for a lot of women is a lot more traumatic than a medical procedure really on in a pregnancy. Um, the people who say that don't also understand how many kids get lost in the system of adoption. And particularly if you, the older a child becomes sometimes, it's harder for them to get adopted. Um, <laughs> non-white children also have problems getting adopted so a lot of these um a lot of these conversations are just if you're having this debate and trying to convince people n uh, point out that there's a bit of uh of r racial undertones to this because um s some of what they're saying is is directed at black women mostly for example Appreciate the call. Does that answer your question? Um, no, that's all. All right. Thanks, Jeremiah. Thank you. Thanks. Calling from a 509 area code. Who's this? Where are we calling from? 
Hey, Sam, it's Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, uh, I'm glad you called. Your apples have made quite a splash around here. I really like them, Ronald Reagan. Thank you. I almost put Emma's name on the box as a gag. Uh, um, I, I would have liked that. Um, but, uh, I, you know, you, you say you like them, and you, you sort of, you're a little bit, you know, grateful, I guess. But then I noticed yesterday you had to go out and spread some pretty extreme misinformation about uh, the apple discrepancy between the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast. I don't want to get into it because I feel like I'm dignifying something that's just so anti-science and, you know, flies in the face of everything we know about horticulture. So, as, you know, we don't really need to get into that. But, you know, I, I was listening when you said those hurtful things. Um, anyways, um, I've got kind of a... When was uh, the first apple grown in uh, the area in which you're referring to in Washington State? Well, I mean, what are uh, you? Can you not answer pure? the question? You can you not answer the question? I just simply, it's a simple question. Simple question. Only, simple, simple, simple question. You only eat apples grown in Kazakhstan or something? It sounded thousands like Michael Tracy. Yeah. Kazakhstan? What? Oh. Who's talking yeah. about Kazakhstan? Answer why the are you question, changing Ron. the. Why are you Tim Pooling this? <laughs> I'm just. Thanos loves I'm just apples. Saying that, I'm just saying that there's much older apples if, if, if the quality of the apple is... Oh, I'm sorry. Can you not answer this question unless I give you a, a boombox and a microphone? Do you need a, a karaoke machine? Uh, yeah. Actually, my daughter does have a frozen karaoke <laughs> uh, machine at home. Oh, okay. You're halfway into... I think you uh, just got your journalism degree. No, so my, actually, I'm going to be Michael Tracy for Halloween. Is that too mean? <laughs> well, it's I think there scary. may be a lot of people who don't know who you're dressed up as, <laughs> except for maybe yeah, your true. kids. Right. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about something. There's a story that um, isn't getting a lot of coverage. I've seen that Amy Goodman has uh, spent a lot of time talking about this, but um other than that, not too much. We we have the the BIF or the bipartisan infrastructure framework and reconciliation, and even at their most ambitious, if we were to combine these things. You're looking at you know four and a half trillion, and and the, the story that people aren't really talking about, other than Amy Goodman, like I said, is that even if you were to say double these, and you know with nine trillion dollars, you're still coming up way short, and we we wouldn't have nearly enough space for uh, BOFA, and isn't that something we should be concerned about wait what bofa bofa both of these nuts hey, hey, hey did you hang up <laughs> i said both of these nuts sam crossing this off the uh, clips to a clip for today yeah <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, just um, since you're refusing to answer the question, the answer is 1826. I had to get my D's nuts joke in, yeah. first of all. Yeah, the answer is 1826. All right, listen, I'll answer your... Let me uh, tell you uh, what... Let me tell you when the first apple tree... This is absurd. ...was planted... Word in edgewise. ...in New York City. Okay. 1647. You show me. There is a heritage of apples in this in this state. Oh, good, good. That is good. Centuries older mm -hmm. than all right now in you Washington show me, State. You show me. First of all, I need you to shut up. Second of all, you show me the peer-reviewed article or study that shows that that matters at all in any way uh, in terms of uh, taste, consistency. You said yesterday, oh, it makes them hardier. They'll last till, you know, March as if you're some sort of fucking pioneer who has to, you know, eat apples in the winter because, uh, you know, nothing's growing or whatever. It, it doesn't have anything to do with how, like, when the trees were first planted. You're just making up historical facts. Like, uh, oh, this thing is, this thing is old. That's like saying, 
you know, the first cars were Ford, so then Ford. How are apples? Car. How are new Apple when cultivars? The, well, you know, the, let me answer first, your question. Let me answer your built, question. First, how are Apple built? cultivars developed? When, how are they developed? I mean, surely you know this. Mm -hmm. How are they developed? Well, this is the thing that finally turns me right wing. Stephen, why? <laughs> Why don't you tell the I've class? To, why don't you tell the class what happens you know, if to, I was to open up one of those Lucy glows you sent me, and I was to take the seeds out and plant them? Well, what kind of apple would I get? Well, it depends. Do you know what kind of apple I would get? No, I don't. Nobody does. We would get five exactly. different varieties. Every, Some of them may be edible, exactly. maybe not. So the exactly. way that we develop new apple cultivars mm. is through trial mm. and error. And if you have mm. 200 years more time for trial and error, your trials are going to be more successful over time. I rest my case. Good day, sir. Mm. Right. Well, I can see why you dropped out of law school after you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, there you go. You're supposed, bye to, bye. you're supposed to end by calling you a horrible, despicable person. But. Yeah, I know. You really, you really missed an opportunity there. I'm not going to lie. Worcester also plays pretty heavily into this. I mean, don't gloss over the fact that he got you. What are you talking about? On Bofa. I, I, I couldn't even follow that. I'll be on. I'll, well, it's immortalized, so you can watch it back. I couldn't even. I couldn't even. Uh, I couldn't even figure that what he was talking about with that. Honestly, I had mm. no idea what he was saying. Um, speaking of which, uh, of no idea what they're saying. <laughs> um, there's a new promotional video out by a, a new interest group that just sort of popped up out of nowhere. Mm. Um, some young people apparently got together. Now, I do think that we, we have examples of um, of people who are progressive and even socialist on uh, on some issues. And then also maybe uh, their religious uh, edicts tell them they're against abortion. Um, I think that's. I do not think that there is necessarily a contradiction there. The contradiction comes in when you want to impose your religious values on the rest of society. You want to use the state to enforce them. Exactly. That said, here is a promotional video for the progressive anti-abortion uprising. And I will say before we play this, um, I suspect this is going to do as well as um, uh, Brandon uh, Tarkenton's whatever. What's that Brandon guy's? Straka. Brandon Starka's oh, right. uh, walk away campaign. But here it is. We are feminists, black, indigenous, Latinos, people of color, and white allies. We are atheist, Muslim, Christians, Jewish, and everything in between. We are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming. And we believe, we believe, and we believe the progressive values of equality, non-violence, and non-discrimination are incompatible, incompatible with abortion. Abortion violence is the redistribution of the oppression people of color, women, the LGBTQ plus community, people who can give birth, and people from low-income backgrounds experience an even more vulnerable population. The unborn. Oh, positive, positive one, okay. positive one, I don't know. Can you explain that to me? It is the redistribution of oppression that 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 is um, th that that people, you know, that people who are uh, of marginal political power, historically marginal political power in our society, they get that oppression, and it's redistributed onto. Uh, fetuses and embryos well basically what they did was they just like took a hat and put a bunch of liberal lefty like 
Gen Z new buzzwords into it, or Gen X or whatever it is. And they picked it out and they decided that this is how it affects fetuses. Does, it, does that, but I mean, honestly, does that make it like, I'm trying to understand what that means. And people from yeah. low income backgrounds experience onto even more vulnerable population. What? I don't know. I'm trying to read some of these captions here. It's saying um, all that suffering that you have are going to have by uh, carrying this unwanted pregnancy to term. You shouldn't just uh, take that out on the baby by uh, getting an abortion. That's what it's trying to say. But they're talking about people like who theoretically would not be forced to uh, carry a a uh, an embryo to 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 birth. I just don't understand how you redistribute oppression. <laughs> Well, this is, I mean, I don't know that these are conservatives acting like uh, liberals or uh, left, but it sounds like people very unfamiliar with these term, terms. There, there's a Point. lot of uh, left is best uh, <laughs> yeah. good quality to this, right? Abortion violence people. is the redistribution of the oppression of people of color. Right. <laughs> All right. So are they well, so wait a second. If that's true, should... Has there been a diminishment Wait, of oppression yeah. of people of color since uh, abortion has been legalized? <laughs> and who who is it? Who is, is it, it one to one? Wait, so more abortion means less depression of of, of black uh, people and uh, other oppressed groups. It also seems to imply that oppression is a fixed static yes. amount of like of of like a, a phenomenon like energy it's like an energy and you must dissipate it in some fashion so what we need to do is take that oppression redistribute it and send it maybe into space maybe we can get elon musk to uh like put it in a, yeah all right well let's continue i'm just trying to figure this out is the redistribution of the oppression people of color, women, the LGBTQ plus community, people who can give birth, and people from low income backgrounds experience, onto an even more vulnerable population, the unborn. Today, we are standing up. Standing up. Standing up. To the democratic establishment and saying, no more. No more. No more. No more. No more. No more. Black lives. Here's the other thing that seems Black a little bit weird. Here's the, here's the other thing that seems a little bit weird. These are progressives um, who are against uh, who are uh, against uh, anti-abortion. We know what the numbers are in terms of abortion in this country. It's not the the right for a woman to to have an abortion is not um, exclusively in the purview of Democratic voters. There are Republican voters. Like, why are they t standing up to the Democratic establishment? They're, I mean, aren't they really against like what over 60 percent of uh, the American population believes? Because the it's democratic just... establishment wants to impose abortion on everybody so they can redistribute oppression oh. for to, to give it to everybody else. I just think that it, this is that that using yeah. Democrats interchangeably and in democratic establishment is like another left is best clue. It's an astroturf campaign. This is another thing that we're going to be seeing like in a few months. Oh, this is funded. Can't by... they get somebody decent to write these damn things though? Like, I mean, yeah. for God's sakes, if they got a ton of money. Send me the thing. I'll do some punch up on the script for you. I'm sure it's just some like like right wing kind of religious organization that has some shady funding that didn't put a ton of thought into it and has no literacy with this kind of language anyway, because they aren't on the left and they got a few cranks, young people who may have religious ideology in and of themselves. And and they said, we'll make put together this video for you and we'll elevate your perspective these That's are it. these are religious kids who uh, think they're on the left because they're not like extremely racist just uh, and uh, misogynistic like against and uh, anti-gay yeah but they kind of maybe are but, but they might be yeah <laughs> just relative to who they're surrounded it, by. The, the, but then they but they use pronouns correctly so it's totally cool let's continue and and and, and listen i'm gonna i'm gonna cop to this right now i'm gonna mention the woman who purports to be Muslim, she may be, but that's just an odd, I don't know what's going on there with that, in that one. But she looks just, like she's 37. Well, I mean, she may not be, I, I don't know if she's, no, I, it's just something I, like- A little, yeah. There's something, there's something oh, a little something bit weird. off about a couple of these folks, Yeah, but actually. go ahead. This is like the nightmare blunt rotation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but. Standing up. Standing up the democratic establishment and saying no more no more 
No more. No more. No more. Black Lives Matter. Trans rights are human rights. Love is love. And let the unborn live. Abortion has no place in the progressive movement. El futuro es pro vida. We are the progressive anti-abortion uprising. And we will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. The pro-life revolution begins now. It begins now. It begins now. This is like classic reactionary ow, uh, ow. talk, right? Like the 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 uh, the beginning of oppressing women's right to choose begins now, finally. And you all want to censor and silence us? With this, we're starting this now. Well, this is a revolution where women don't get to decide what to do with their bodies. <laughs> For decades and centuries, we have been oppressed by women's right to to say, you know, how they live their lives and what the uh, economic uh, interest of their and the trajectory of their lives are going to be. And we are done with it. No more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, too much, too much youth group energy there. Honestly, let's, they, they, well, wait, like... let's go back to the lady. <laughs> she now look I, 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 like, I, I'm hesitant to do this because I know people are going to focus like what is he? but I just think like, there's a weird energy about the, the, the I thought the lady I had to go like back yes you, yeah. you're right because I honestly had to go back and see like what was her identity because the second time she says like we will not be silenced or something like that it I'm sorry to say this but I got handmade uh, tail vibe. That's yeah. exactly what I got. I was like, wait a second. Is she like one of those people who work at like old Sturbridge village who comes out and is like, Hey, we're going to be churning the butter today. <laughs> but they thought I was a witch, <laughs> you know, like, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I, you know, like I, I, you know, like just, just go because like she was allowed out because she was able to do this video. So she took did the most of it. I'm outside for the, or, I mean, I guess. And also, go back. A I mean, I guess further. that's a kafia that she's wearing. Go back even further to the LGBT Underneath. guy sign, because this guy says I'm a Christian, but he has the big LGBT signs. Um, uh -huh. uh, a little bit further, I think it's just a guy. Um, it's the dude. If you can scroll, he's holding the sign. Oh, back or forth? I well, it's somewhere in there. Maybe it's after. It might be after. It's the kid who says I'm a. Actually, it's after her, because maybe it's right before. It's actually right. <laughs> I don't know. Just play it. Play it there. Uh, that's good. Onto an even more vulnerable population. The unborn. Yeah, I mean, hey, you're yeah. standing yeah. up. Start at the beginning. Yeah, so let's... There's one kid that says, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Okay. Just play it. We are feminists, black, indigenous, Latinos, people of color, and white allies. We are atheist, Muslim, Christians, Jewish, and everything in between. Christians, it's Christians when he's holding up the LGBT stuff, so it's like not the hateful kind, though. Um, but yeah. LGBT and Democrat standing for life. But mm. he says Christians. That's right after this. She says the Muslim. LGBT plus Democrat standing for life. <laughs> With the American flag there, too. Like Look, that. kids, you can be against uh, abortion personally in your life. Just don't advocate for the state to uh, enforce your beliefs, and you're still welcome. Um, <laughs> but I also stop making videos. But the revolution begins now. It begins now. And what that means is we'll do one or two viral videos at the behest of this shady moneyed organization. And I'll get to feel like I contributed something to society with my wacky and consistent beliefs, and the church group's going to love it. And that's the revolution. <laughs> that's so strange. That's such a strange ad. I like how, though, you uh, assume that that woman was like both Amish and Muslim. I, I mean, I, I, I take a word that she's she's Muslim and she has a kafia on and yeah. uh, and a, and a hoodie. It's just like she had a weird energy about it's it. It's a bit jarring. Yeah. There's, the, there's. I mean, like, I guess energy. my point is this: is that like you're trying to get. You're trying to assemble a crew of people. Like, even in the, if I give them the 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 complete benefit of the doubt that this is you know completely organic i'm sure these people are you know feel this way it would be impossible for me to imagine you wouldn't be able to find 10 people uh similarly situated who were against abortion i just feel like put your best foot forward and uh i just you know like i feel like 
you, you could have you could have found it's someone to represent got. Uh, Islam, you know, who might be like just not have such weird energy going on. Yeah, I that's know. all I'm saying. That's well, all I'm saying. I'm just this, this is this is like a this. I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm trying to do constructive criticism of the psyop <laughs> of the psyop. Um, yeah, right. Of the like, you know, basement level D minus Christian group psyop. You know, you got to do it like the CIA does it. You have to pour your resources into it if you're going to make sure it's effective. Yeah, this was the demo punk rock version of this awoke CIA. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> it's the B side. <laughs> we got a uh, news from Jake Sherman at Punchbowl. Oh, man. Leader McConnell just told a closed meeting of Senate Republicans that he would offer a short term debt ceiling extension today or offer Senator Schumer an exp expedited reconciliation process. So now Mitch McConnell is going to be the hero who saves the debt ceiling. Um, what's, a, what's amazing about this, too, it's like the, the, just the idea like uh, Leader McConnell changed his mind. And so uh, the entire Republican uh, caucus is going to completely uh, say, OK, like, it really is sort of stunning to me. They're like, that's all it takes. Uh, I've, guys, I've, I mean, this is why they're better at it is yeah. because they, you know, function in lockstep. Meanwhile, we have two rogue senators who are determining the entire agenda. Who the might Democratic be working for Mitch, too. Right. right. Who might be. And, and, and the, you know, like all of this posturing, like, are, is, is she, are the Democrats going to come out and go, like, we got victory. Victory. You like you you you're letting McConnell pull you around by your wee wees uh, for for the for the benefit of an expedited reconciliation process. Like oh now we don't have to have two voteramas, we won. They, I mean, do they realize like 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 this is like no one cares. You want to have five voteramas is exactly like you had no voteramas to. 99.999999% of the people who will ever vote for you or not vote for you. Every human being on earth does not care if you have one Votorama, no Votoramas, or 50 Votoramas. They just, the, the, the myopia is just like, it's, it's stunning. I don't know how many times I'm going to say stunning today because of these idiots. Well, um, you oh, your average a day is like five. So, a little over. This is, uh, this. let's play this clip. This is awesome. The thing you keep hearing about why COVID's not real is if COVID was real, <laughs> how would there be homeless people alive? Hmm. Now, I'm not Many sure. Many people are saying this. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the logic here. Um, the homeless population in this country is what is approximately half a million. Is that right? Or unhoused? I think so. Um, and one of the things about being unhoused is that a lot of time you spend outside. Um, so you may not be in the same sort of circumstances in which people uh, pass COVID. Maybe you are. I don't have, we don't have figures as to how many uh, unhoused people have died of COVID. Uh, we do know that there's been some cities that have been pretty good about putting uh, folks up at least temporarily, which I think shows that we could do that more. But the point is, is that the concept that homeless people have not all just died away it is not evidence that COVID is fake. But that seems to be very difficult for some uh, anti-vaxxers to understand. Here is an anti-vax demonstration on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles, California, where a anti-vax demonstrator gets a lesson about um, all of their assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> I want you 
want you to replay it because that guy in the uh, in the pushing the cart with the white shirt walks by. And she says, like, do you see all these homeless people on the, uh, uh, you know, if they're um, if uh, uh, on the street with COVID? Hell no. Why? And then this uh, guy with the uh, white shirt walks by and he goes, because I'm vaccinated, you dumb fuck. Uh, so <laughs> let's play this again. Listen carefully. <laughs> <laughs> there you go he's vaccinated we, the way she's talking stand. about him as if he like doesn't have the capacity to respond like she's just commenting on him like look at these homeless people surrounding us uh, wouldn't they all be gone if the covid was such a real thing it's literally like she's talking about the palm trees right right look at these non-people around us yeah. They're still breathing. Obviously, COVID is fake. Like it's and, the one thing I was hoping. It's like she's hoping for that from COVID or something. Like that. Right, right. And I think what part of it is that they're also conspiracy, conspiracy theorizing that the vaccine is a way to depopulate the planet in the vein of Bill Gates. Um, so she's trying to say that COVID isn't real and that's why these like undesirable people haven't been killed off i'm trying to like web into the conspiracy theory but like everything for these covid denying conspiracy theorists is like a determining factor there's no correlation everything is causation and everything fits into the same narrative <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is let's um there was a uh facebook whistleblower testifying uh in front of the uh Senate Consumer Protection Subcommittee yesterday. Um, we, we can play some clips from that, but I'm more interested in what I find completely fascinating. And look, there is no doubt that um, elements of, of Google, elements of, well, I would say Google is more aligned with uh, Democrats than Facebook and Amazon, uh, Bezos, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, you know, when you look at like uh, someone like, obviously like uh, Peter Thiel, uh, Facebook is I think more aligned without a doubt with with the Republicans and conservatives. I mean, you can look at- Joe Kaplan? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just enormous amount of evidence of it. Uh, my opinion is, all of these companies should be broken into tiny pieces or, or smaller pieces. I mean, just actually, if I'm not going to be a, um, uh, use hyperbole. Um, what is fascinating is the way conservatives and would-be conservatives, so I'm including, you know, uh, Greenwald, not a conservative, just an anti um anti i guess anti-liberal mm. um the way that they avoid any type of structural change and i know that glenn has now in his tweets is starting to recognize because he's probably heard this criticism because he apparently spends all day online googling himself constantly uh that he never um has promoted antitrust measures in the past to my knowledge and now he's sort of like giving at least the head uh, uh, shake to it. But let's be clear. There has been one set of major antitrust hearings over the past couple of years, really over the past 10 years, and they have been initiated and held by Democrats. Does that mean that the entire Democratic Party is uh, promoting antitrust? No, but it does mean that like someone like the the snake lady or whatever uh, uh you know elizabeth warren has built my her mostly her career on two different things like bankruptcy and antitrust um that there is a massive push within the democratic party to the extent that one exists it's in the democratic party there are one or two maybe maybe um republicans 
who have been at least talking about the problem of of consolidation of power. But to argue that there is any political party that is um, looking at antitrust and the Democrats not being the first word out of it. Now, are they doing it sufficiently to my... Um, no, there's a, there's a big fight. But the fight is happening in the Democratic Party. In the Republican Party, there is no fight. There's just a couple of people who are just like, you know, because you can find uh, people who, you know, espouse anything. And so it's fascinating to see what's going on on the right when they talk about Facebook. Because the whole game here is, again hide the ball in terms of structural change and make it about nefarious players with nefarious agendas that are all a function of personalities and there's nothing structural to see here. It is all just because of decrepit values and because they're authoritarian degeneracy and of degeneracy liberals. of liberals and all of this. There's no structurally Ronald Reagan changed the definition of of what constitutes a monopoly with the help of Robert Bork, or basically Robert Bork did it with the help of Ronald Reagan. That is just simply the reality of, of our politics. When we went from the idea of a monopoly being assessed, not just based upon whether it provides uh, low cost goods for consumers, but whether it inhibited democracy and competition that's the story. Everything else is just BS. Here's Laura Ingram with some of that BS. Hmm. Does no one else think the timing of this is just a little too convenient? Biden's on the ropes, and the Democrats are barreling toward a brutal beatdown in the midterms. Could this just be a clever way to rev up the speech police against alternative points of view of head of the election? All under the guise of protecting the children. The reconciliation bill was a culmination of my service in Congress, because it was about the children. The children, the children, the children. They love citing the children. Well, let's begin with one basic fact. The left doesn't care if the culture or big business spreads content that's not appropriate for children. They never have. They literally do not care. In fact, for decades, liberals have defended, even celebrated, cultural and political forces that harm children. Mm -hmm. Porn, drugs, gambling, gender bending, school shutdowns, mask mandates, and of course their holy grail of abortion. Democrats support all of it. Now, some on the left would prefer if we didn't even have children. Yeah, you know. Well, uh, you know, there's times some people. I got to admit. Um, I know somebody who wishes he doesn't have a sister, and that's Laura Ingram's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Who says she's a Nazi because also their dad was a Nazi. Yeah. But but here's the thing. I mean, you'll notice what she did here, right? Um, what Pelosi, and you can uh, take it for what it's worth, Pelosi's talking about the reconciliation bill is for children. She's talking about things like pre-K. She's talking about child tax credit. She's talking about um, um, a whole host parental leave. There's a whole host of, of features of the reconciliation bill. But that has nothing to do with what's going on with Facebook. Um, and when they say, you know, you have one or two people bringing up Finstas and whatnot. The bottom line is the company abuses its power. The company also, just coincidentally, and I don't know that Google does this. I want the same thing to happen with Google. The idea that Facebook in any way suppresses conservative uh, thought or speaking is just simply absolutely 100% untrue. There has not been a single week that has gone by where conservatives haven't dominated the top 10 or 20 uh, ben links. Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, sites. Candace Owens, Daily Wire. Dan Blaze, Bongino. Dan Bongino. Ben so, I mean, suddenly, Dan Bongino is like no longer in favor. That's weird. Must be a part of the big liberal conspiracy. Um, and you talk, yeah, I mean, and what she's trying to do there too is when you're talking about degenerate liberals, right? She brings up all of those things that they want your kids to watch porn on Facebook, which like, all right, I don't know about that. But I mean, she's trying to make it and wrap it into the broader conservative project going into the midterms which is the same thing with critical race theory it's the same thing with mat with mask mandates and it's just a bit more of a light diet version of what the q people are obsessed with which is that there are 
there is a cohort of liberal elites who have way more money and they participate in a culture that you don't understand and they're indoctrinating your children and changing the way that they view the world that will be different from the way that you view it and it has a lot of misogyny baked into there as well and all of this is just to cash in on the general anxiety that everyone is feeling about these social media companies and their power over people and hide the ball as you say make it about this scary indoctrination and don't make it about hurting the people behind the curtain and their shareholder profits and the money that would that is there to be had in investment in massive companies like this uh bear oh, at home on. or is this on the topic i just have one thing to say on this this tech company thing the tech companies have an, a problem kind of similar to what oil companies have with their workforce that they're upset about the direction of the company and the product uh, and the effect it has on society and this has been a problem with um, zuckerberg you can see articles saying facebook employees even before this whistleblower upset about say um we're addicting kids or body dysmorphia or the political stuff and what, the, what this moment right now is it's they're calling it a free speech thing but really this is about the authoritarian control of these monopolies management over their workforce so um, peter Thiel and joel kaplan and mark zuckerberg can decide what facebook's going to do with their algorithms and stuff, and stuff like that and all the employees they can just get bent they can try whistleblowing they can try whatever but right now facebook's accusing the whistleblower of stealing stuff and so that's the game that they're going to play like uh, that's what this is about. This is about management control over their workforce that doesn't want to do what they're doing. Yeah, they're going to uh, consolidate in in uh, in response to this uh, and like really tighten up and make sure that all of like their algorithm is an advice. Barrett Holmes says, "Did you just call Elizabeth Warren the Snake Lady?" Yes, I was mocking those who would say i meant snake emoji lady the, the i was mocking those who uh six months ago or whatever it was a year ago were saying uh she's a snake emoji and don't recognize that she's the one who uh, who has been on the forefront of now what you think is actually the legitimate response to these things i mean let's be clear socialists and those to the left the socialists really don't have uh, much interest in, I think they should have more because I, I believe that there's a, you know, uh, in terms of a certain path, uh, but don't have an ideological interest in the concept of antitrust because it is a reformation of our current system. I happen to think that the, the, if you want to get to a system of socialism, you're going to have to diminish the power, the the concentration of power by individual sectors and individual players within those sectors. But that's another argument. But for those who purport to say the Democratic Party doesn't, you know, only doesn't really care about any structural reform of places like Facebook and Google, it just so happens that the person that you also said was a snake emoji for a long time is probably the one of the most prominent people in the most. all of our yeah the, yeah right. all of our politics well and the left not being at that table means that i think like the the left response would be what well, we need to impo like i said the workers at these companies need to have more of a say in what they're doing and so if you make like google and uh facebook and and all these places more worker controlled as opposed to like um executive controlled then you're getting towards somewhere but the left isn't like you said it's not really no, the left like, wastes to, its you time crying about more... like a moment at the uh, Democratic debate in 2020 as opposed to maybe having but, a bit more comprehensive of who is useful and who is not in these conversations. You get more worker power, the smaller the company is. And, and I mean, before you even I I impose any structural reform, you get more worker power in a smaller company, obviously, because they because they have they have more capacity to shut things down. They, uh, there's greater dependence of management on the workers when that uh, ratio is, is smaller. But also, the, to the extent that you want to create structures so that workers have more say within the workplace, you also first need to deal with the, the, the power that these people who don't want that to happen have. And the way you diminish that power is you make them smaller. 
Um, I, I agree about the path thing. I think um, antitrust is just what America does before it does any sort of like explicit class warfare. Like, but that's we... what you always say, right? It's not sufficient, but it is necessary. Well, yeah, it will help the playing field. Too. It's exactly, exactly what it needs to happen. You exactly. can like again, there are there's not one path. There are four hundred different paths, and you pick the ones that get us to the place where we need to be. There's no magic or pill. There's no silver bullet. It's ridiculous. Let's go to the phones. Calling from a 219 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hey, Sam. It's, um, it's actually Sam. I'm from the uh, industrially ravished uh, Gary, Indiana. Um, awesome to be calling. Longtime listener. Uh, super huge fan of what you guys do and the crew. Um, like everyone else says, in a somber, somber tone, Miss, Miss Michael, but uh, super, super cool that you answered. Listen, the reason I called, um, I would consider myself a pretty far leftist. Um, pretty been listening to you guys for a long time, and really um, solidified my position as far as you know where I stand. Um, the only thing I do disagree with you guys on is um, you guys were kind of talking or touching on it a little bit ago. But I, I do feel like, as leftists, we should not be pushing for more regulations on the individual as far as gun ownership um, and, and be a little bit um, more on the side of individual rights and, and systematic regulation. Um, so I'm wondering what you would say on that part, because I do think it's a little bit maybe hypocritical of us to try to say uh, we want less regulation on the bodily autonomy of a woman I mean, obviously, I hate drawing that line, but you guys were talking about that as well. Um, but also um, trying to, you know, play that game of of saying individual rights for a woman, but no individual rights um, for a constitutional right. Um, so, so I guess that's my point. And 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 hope well, to hear I what mean, you have to well, say about it. again, thanks for answering. Okay, well, but let me just let me just uh, uh, keep you on on the line for a second. First off. I, it is not a question of an individual right. It is, this is not a right. It is denying a, a certain sovereignty to women as opposed to uh, men or, um, uh, you know, anyone else is the issue, right? It's denying a certain right to people who have the ability to, to gestate, essentially. Uh, that's the issue. I don't think there is a constitutional right for people to carry a weapon in this country. Um, the Supreme Court disagrees. Their, um, their, their ruling carries more sway than mine in that regard. But it's not a question of defending, you know, just generically the notion of uh, individual rights. It's also a question of like, what is in the best interest of society and people? And in my mind, it is in the best interest of the portion of the massive portion of people in our uh, society who can get pregnant to have the ability to decide that they don't want to be forced to carry uh, that pregnancy to term. Um, I think it is in the yeah. best interest of our society to not have people walking around with weapons. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree. I mean, like I said, you, I, I'm not making the point that, you know, abortion should be, you know, regulated or criminalized or anything. I think you but know, you're I'm making the point. Honestly. You're I'm, making. I'm, but, well, my point, I was just drawing, trying to draw a parallel. Yeah. My, my real point was, well, I mean, I guess my point is, I guess. But what on what a, grounds a better, are you? Better metaphor. Yeah, but hold on. But no, but OK, I, but I would say, hold I would on for say, one like, second. Listen, for example, Sam, wait, okay, wait, wait, listen. The point is, is you're trying to draw a parallel on a plane in which we as progressives or leftists should be concerned about individual rights stripped of what those rights are. And I'm suggesting to you that, um, no, <laughs> that's you. You're just making a choice on where to draw that parallel. And I'm saying wrong. I'm looking at um, the, the rights of these individuals and in terms of like what it means for society. And I think it is not healthy for society well, to have a significant portion of know, its population, you, almost half, said, who are forced. You, said that you think, you know, who are forced. You, you say, 
to change the trajectory of their lives because of the moral values of other people. I don't think that's healthy for society. I also don't I mean, think it's yeah, healthy I think for society. Your, your the choir. You really don't have to. I, I really, I, I really don't even. Maybe it's my fault for bringing up the abortion thing. I, I really don't think there should be like you know. I'm, I'm agreeing with you on the abortion subject, but but I, I am disagreeing with you on the fact that you say gun ownership is not constitutional because I do think it is. It's you know obviously the Second Amendment, and I, and I do also think that it's a slippery slope to try to combat that or push against that Second Amendment, and 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 because. Um, do you know what uh, First Amendment auditors are? I'm, I mean, it's a pretty pretty common thing. Uh, Emma's uh, was an alma mater. Uh, actually, did a, a quick story on a First Amendment auditor who was assaulted by the police officers, and, and they said that if this happened 20 years ago, you had your, your teeth knocked out. Um, and and if we if we combat or push back against the Second Amendment, which does exist, which is on paper, which you know the Supreme Court agrees with. Yeah, it says it's gonna, a well regulated use, militia, though. You're trying. They're, but, they're trying. They're going to try to. They're going to try to use that same narrative to try to regulate the First Amendment, which gives us the freedom of speech, freedom to uh, regress our, our our redress our our government officials and things of that sort. So I do think it is a slippery slope if we try to regulate, you know, the so individual's right to own if guns. You think it, and then and then and they're going to use that same me, that same narrative. Me, I get I get your, I get your I get your point. Your point is is that the Supreme Court um, operates on this. Um, chaste set of logical and coherent va ideological values that are very consistent with themselves. And if we in some way try and push back against the 2008 ruling, which fundamentally reversed the way that the Supreme Court had been interpreting this, the, the, the Second Amendment since 1939, that that will allow them the license which they wouldn't have otherwise had to abridge the First Amendment. And I just think that's fanciful. I, I don't think that the Supreme Court justices are legal computers. I, mean, I think that they're partisans. I think that they have an end game that they want, and then they use, they reverse engineer it. And so I think the idea of a slippery slope is absurd. Uh, I recognize that the Supreme Court, its, it, it, its rulings carry the day, um, uh, but... You know, I can cite I, I, I can cite I can cite right. 90 years of precedent before the Heller decision in 2008 that would say your interpretation of the Constitution is incorrect. Now, the fact is, is that the interpretation that's existed for 13 years and is, has slippery sloped since then um, is the one that carries but the day. But uh, I'm sorry to just simply say that, like, you know, well, pushing back against this perception. What, are you saying the same thing about abortion? Like, uh, does, does um, the fact that there are people who are fighting against a woman's right to choose, is that a slippery slope that is going to what? Give us give us what? I mean, let's instead of you using well, the Second Amendment as something that if we push against, there's some slippery slope that's going to bridge the First Amendment. What about the woman's right to choose? We're seeing that being pushed back against in the Supreme Court. Where's the slippery slope there? I don't understand what, what point you're trying you to make. You just there. made well, a point to me that if we... using that as I... No, I understand, but put aside that for a moment. You just said to me that pushing it back against the Second Amendment is going to open the door for the Supreme Court, I guess, to abridge the First Amendment. Well, what about the pushback that abortion rights have gotten? What's the slippery slope there? Like, I mean, if there's a slippery slope when we push back against the 13 years of precedence that exists for the Second Amendment, what's the slippery slope on the other side? Where's, where is the erosion of a woman's right to choose that has been the law of the land for, 30, uh, for 40 years, 50 years? Mm -hmm. What's the slippery slope on that side? Or does the slippery slope only work well, when I you're think, talking about I, Second Amendment? I think if we normalize regulating the individual, I think we're going to head towards that direction. But I, I, I do think, like for example, drug use. Like, I, I mean, I'm I'm all for the deregulation of drug use and and the decriminalization of drug use because I think it's all a systemic systemic issue. And and along with the you know weapon by, or gun violence and things of that sort, I think it's more parallel with, um, you know, the the. Why did you just change the subject? 
because well, because I think I, I don't really understand what point you're trying to make. And, and my point in general is is that I think we shouldn't try to regulate the individual and instead fight for um, structural differences and structural change yeah, instead of well, trying, to, try, trying I, to try to restrict the, the, the single person. Maybe Matt, you can you can you know, Yeah, this got confused by the abortion better. stuff and the and the the slippery slope stuff. But basically, like I think a left approach to the gun issue it should be like you're going to stop manufacturers from just um, allowing certain classes of weapons and uh, not penalizing people for having them on the street. Yeah. Right. And I think we all agree with that. Right. I mean, it's look, only when you, yeah, and, yeah. It's uh, right, because, because, okay, I think, because fine. I think again, again, weapon violence is again, uh, uh, an effect of, of, you know, uh, of just general violence that's been triggered because people are so desperate and hungry. Like, you know, my mom said, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. And lots of people are hungry right now, you know, socioeconomically speaking. And, and these cause violence and, and, and in turn cause, you know, uh, gun violence. But I don't think that guns are necessarily the issue. I think they're just the tool that are being used because of uh, people's, you know, remorse towards, towards structure, people's remorse towards power. Yeah, uh, people I mean, remorse for government, and I think it can. I think it can be dangerous for the left to try to push for this, you know, higher regulation um, when we really should be fighting. You know, all right, well, let's shut down the, the gun manufacturers. You know? Right, exactly. I mean, that's it, there's certainly an amplifier of those things, even if they don't cause them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I think the approach should be yeah, you shouldn't be allowed to buy even things that could be described as semi-automatic or whatever, like that. that, that those sorts of like weapons of war like you can get a shotgun you can get maybe like a six shooter or something like that um and, and like stuff that's useful for hunting maybe too but any of this like um clip stuff it's get it out of here you you, you should have to be licensed I mean, in the military i just think the 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 point is is that a city should be able to say we don't want guns on our streets right i agree with that too i mean well, I mean, that's a bit of like, you know, I, I, that's like a bit of a, a state's right kind of argument, I guess. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, but I do think. Well, that, I, think, as, I think the, the, the state, the, the federal government should be able like, to say that, too. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Well, like, I just, a, I just think the federal government should be able to say you can't be here because you're black. I mean, it's really the same thing because it's civil liberties. And, and again, like I said, no, civil liberties. It's not, not the making same these thing. comparisons. Stick no, to the That's guns. not the same thing. Yeah, you're, you're really confusing the issues. By that's not the same thing. Comparisons. Like, right, okay, well, maybe... I, like, there's I, a problem... I will, I will, I'll take, I'll well, how about this? Do you feel comfortable with the, the state saying, like, we're not going to regulate the ability of a boss to make a child work 16 hours a day? But I think, I think that's structural, not individual. We're not putting regulations on the individual. We're, we're putting regulations on the structure, on, on, on the systemic or the system of, of labor, which I think is completely different than my point, which is we shouldn't regulate the individual. We should regulate the, the, the system, the systemic issues. But at some we point, should, all know, right, how about this? The federal the government has the ability to control commerce. Okay, do you have a problem well, with that? Does. But Congress is structural, so yeah, I have no problem with that. Great. So I want the federal government to say that guns cannot be sold, or like carried around in New York City. And I'm but sorry, that, but, that, but that also that also counteracts, like I said, the Constitution, which gives us the right. right. To so no, say, you're into I got a question. Um, so do you think people should just be able to open Dude, a carrier? You don't think that this Supreme Court yeah, is right. also going to find think, that it counteracts the carry, the Constitution it's a, it's, to have things like child labor laws or eight-hour work weeks? These are all things that are structural things. No, no, but but dude, 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 you don't, you just told me that the reason why the federal government can't outlaw the sale of guns is because the Constitution says so. I got news for you. In five years. I I said shouldn't. Shouldn't. I got news for you. In five years, this Supreme Court is also going to say the federal government doesn't have the right to regulate the workplace. So don't keep citing I mean, to me I, this I Supreme guess, Court as some type of you're, like you're, arbiter. You're drawing, you're drawing parallels, and like I said, I, gotta I, I go. can also say this thing. I gotta which go. Just drawing different sides. Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> okay, Thank man. You. I, I appreciate, appreciate the call. Thank much you. love, to, much love to you guys, and I appreciate it. All right. It's just uh, frustrating. Like every time we like talk one topic, he'll jump to another. I'll just say. Um, if if he wants to call back later and say that we should just allow people to open carry around New York City, uh, no. I think whatever we do with regards to defund the police, we should still have a force uh, that is able to respond to people that are carrying around uh, big weapons of war around um, cities that don't want them there. I think we can actually use that level of like municipal power to... Um, regulate the individual i mean I don't have honestly a like, like i mean well forget about can what about tanks like i i understand like a broader point like, <laughs> like we can't like look 
because it is the point about the stop and frisk thing, right? Like we're the guns thing. We know who that's going to affect. And so you like, I get there's a sensitivity there, but when you take it, the extremity of we're going to like, let people just carry guns around the city. No, sorry. You're fine. You can't just do that. I, I just think that like, um, the idea that pushing back against the, where the second amendment is, if the Supreme court well, comes in just, and does it, it's like the, the, Saying the what's idea constitutional that... and what isn't. It's exactly. Just, it's not a fixed concept. And, like, there's too much faith in institutions and, like, ancient documents that have been altered and changed uh, at political whims that was embedded in his conversation. Well, I, that's the I thing that I, I actually, found frustrating. Is... I don't really give a shit what the Constitution says. Well, the because at the end of the day, this Supreme Court is going to rule that all of the structural things that he's talking about that government should be able to do is unconstitutional. And then is that are we should, Whatever, should we not push back on that? There's there's like a very very finite amount of um, rights embedded in the Constitution that are not going to be like politically infringed upon, and that dwindles with every day as society becomes more complex and we are move further and further away from the founding of the nation. So like I, I it's just I I feel like we're having like a I, I, a, a college con, con law debate about this that isn't necessarily embedded well, in Well, and the real, I mean, the structural thing is like things like gun liability too, right? Like, and those are things we need to address, the gun shop liability stuff. And I, But yeah, I, I think you will need to regulate the individuals to some degree. And I don't think that should be viewed as like leading to a slippery slope. And I also just like, I don't see where the upside is to sort of like disengage from that fight for leftism I, I mean like i can understand people who say like oh, we want the leftists to have guns oh, okay but i don't understand like how uh arguing that the second amendment that there should be a right to inhibit people carrying that um is in some way an inhibition of people's rights i mean are we going to say that you're allowed to you should be allowed to drive a tank down the street uh, we, i mean like like where like what um I sort of think having a significant portion of the population weaponized starts to become structural at one point because, you know, it's a little bit coercive. Yeah. It's not democratic. Let's put it that way. Or I think if you're worried about slippery slopes, I think having a significant portion of the population armed mm. has a, there's a, if you, if you start getting too close to that slippery slope, you're going to go, it's going to be a little bit less democratic. I'm quite convinced of that. Um, all right, folks, sadly, that is the phone portion of our program. Um, uh, okay. Mama Zinema, you had like 25,000 uh, things here. Let's see. Uh, until the cops give up the guns, we are staying strapped G unit out. Uh, drugs aren't regulated. I need a howitzer and an AA gun to defend my house from drone attacks. <laughs> Craven Moore, uh, hump day. Does that mean Emma will read one of my IMs? Emma's delightful cul-de-sac. All socks, ALS, uh, ALCS. Could be, could be. Doubtful. Uh, I doubt, doubt it too, but I'm not going to talk that way. Q for short. Hello from Idaho. Our Lieutenant Governor tried to activate our National Guard and send them to the border while our governor was out of state. She also signed an order banning vax and COVID test mandates in schools. Second time she's done a stunt like this since Democratic candidates are DOA in the state. I'm going to have to register as a Republican to vote against her in our primary. Otherwise, she'll surely be our new governor. Living in a one party state sure is exhausting. Wow. But liberals are hegemonic. David from Munda Cheese. Uh, the way we treat our Supreme Court always makes me think of the Oracle from the movie 300. I mean, we might as well have to climb a mountain <laughs> to consult them at every, the very top for some cryptic answers based on their own individual whims. Yes, that's also very holes. Uh, GS9 Sam, not watching today, is protest for the Yankees Red Sox game yesterday. Communist dog, one surefire way to make Republicans pay for the debt ceiling standoff is to hold up Social Security payments. Michael Tracy's delightful girlfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, our mansion in cinema down with raising the debt ceiling with 50 votes. Mansion seems opposed to a filibuster carve out because reasons. Well, in this instance, I think he's not opposed to it because he doesn't want it to go into the, the, the big uh, Build Back Better reconciliation because mm -hmm. he doesn't want to be forced to vote for that. He doesn't want to be what? Forced to vote for that. Uh, sorry. Jennifer from St. Louis. Don't apple varieties also die out as they get older? Therefore, newer may be better. 
There's like 4,000 uh, apple varieties. I think at the I think Cornell has uh, them. Mm. Uh, if you're going to live in a society, you have to accept some amount of limitation of individual rights. Indeed. Um, Tom from Yakubia, one of my favorite sponsors. Which ones aren't your favorite? Mm. I, I mean, there's like two tiers of, I would say two to three tiers of sponsors. Maybe don't say them on air. Yeah, I probably wouldn't. But I mean, I, there's no, I, there's none I don't like. I won't do those. But like, I have a different relationship in my mind <laughs> with like uh, Sunset Lake and Just Coffee, for instance, than I do the others. Um, it's also not through the same service. It's not through the same service. And, you know, like, it, like, People who come seek out the show because they listen to the show, which is how those advertisers, I, I just have a different relationship with because they're more movement oriented in my mind. Yeah. Uh, I should call in and tell you my experience with cinema 15 years ago. I hate her like poison. You, uh, may, we may have missed that. Sam's Apple broker friend. Another thing should motivate Schumer, McConnell for that matter, to give a plan about the debt ceiling is that each fight of it, more and more people become aware of mint the coin and the complete fallacy of the debt ceiling is what follows. Uh, yeah, I don't think people are becoming more aware of anything, including mint the coin. Agreed. Majority Report wardrobe coordinator, the Venn diagram of people who believe a fetus has a heartbeat at six weeks and who believe that a woman has one more rib than a man is effing circle. Uh, one Ernest Peacock viewer, I appreciate the sports talk at the beginning of every episode, but all this boring Chevron defense discussion about the relationship between the court and the agency is a bit too in the weeds for me. <laughs> it takes all the fun out of basketball for me. <laughs> Harry's uh, word. Love the show, Sam. Keep up the good work. Hey, I'm our crew. Roe v. Wade is definitely important. I don't want to downplay the material impacts on women. That being said, the right uses that what? ruling as a wedge issue to drive their voters to the polls. So I'm not sure they want to actually reverse the ruling. Uh... Also, why isn't there pressure on the Dems to legislate the ruling and circumvent the courts? I mean, they've passed it in the House, or they're going to. Um, Another reason to abolish the filibuster. Well, the, the problem is I don't know that Manchin would vote for it, to be honest with you. But maybe. Uh, well, maybe you could get... <laughs> Black quantum Collins. physics is coming for your uh, white and white me. adjacent youth brought to you by the super woke communist libs and socialist Antifa group in partnership with Project Replace Whitey, soon to be in every school near you. <laughs> Recursive snowflakery. Well, I'm intensely depressed from today's interview now. Sorry about that. Uh, Mrs. Shapiro Dapp. It is uh, so frustrating listening to the Fox and Friends segment from yesterday where they talked about 20% of immigrants having COVID. They conveniently left out the part where this was a test after leaving uh, CBP custody, making it seem like the dirty immigrants are bringing COVID to us. I'm sure CBP is enforcing social distancing and handing out masks to immigrants. Just evil. Also, even if it were true that 20% of um, uh, arriving immigrants had COVID, that's just an indictment of the worldwide vaccine deployment. That of the ideology that embryo fetus is an independent baby is spreading fast outside of the U.S., but especially after Texas abortion law. Like Middle East Twitter, adopt the same talking points. Keep in mind, the Middle East has a majority of Muslims. Islam does not, doesn't ban abortion. In fact, most the most restrictive religious opinion, underlying opinion, thinks that abortion shouldn't be performed after the third trimester. Some say the beginning, some say the end. Even those restrictive options also put the life of the mother in first and say an abortion can be performed after the third trimester. It affects your life. But we all know these abortion laws are designed to restrict women's freedom. So no wonder conservatives everywhere are taking a few notes from this abortion law. Ryan Cole, can states still enforce regulated standards that Supreme Court demolishes? I'm thinking about California having the, the greatest purchasing power. Um, states, I think, should be able to come up with their own set of regulations. And th that may have an impact across the country, like California does when it comes to cars, but not necessarily in environmental stuff. You know, it's, it's not going to help, uh, it, it, you know, you're just going to have these factories locate in places where they can dump their crap into the local, you know, wa uh, river or something. Um, all right, we'll take, uh, oh boy, got a lot of these. I'll take uh, 10 more of these. Train boy. Trains don't have smokestacks anymore, Sam. Yes, apples have been grown in New York City longer than Jews have. Well, I think it's probably pretty close, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, Pierre Pants, is there a gas leak in the office today? Please be safe. <laughs> Josh from Tucson, 
We have a saying at our house, Emma, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. I'm not actually drinking alcohol. Just want to let people understand. <laughs> no, that's the case. Sam say bad day. <laughs> right, exactly. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, Warren from Toronto. Sam with the Washington Generals analogy today. Sports slowly seeping into more MR spike proteins, and I love it. M majority report. Yep. Where are we at? Four. Uh, Cattle Town Napper. The Kazakhstan comment was because that is where apples come from. Yes, I know. Also, your Snapdragons are only about a decade old, barely. Wait, wait is Kazakhstan the land of Eden? That's where apples come from. Yep. Oh. Uh, if age breed made it good, Red Delicious would live up to its name. Originates in 1872. All right, just take it easy. <laughs> What are we at, five now? Socialist bear. Hey, Sam, have you seen the recent 538 on progressive evangelicals? It's kind of amazing. I have not. Will from Indiana. Don't know if you saw, but there's a huge development in the Zodiac Killer case. A group of specialists identified an entirely new suspect who died in 2018 that was living near the Zodiac murders took place. I'm kidding. It's Ted Cruz. For real, though, hopefully this brings us a step closer to solving the yes, mystery. Yes, yes. They are saying that the case breakers, though, we don't know if that's, like, legit. I don't know. And also, um, not to like just end on a horrible note, but we were talking about gun control that there was um there was a shooting at a high school in Texas. Right, oh, Jesus. Uh Demian, how do I de radicalize a parent? It's absurd. My mother's immune to facts. She just parrots anti vaccine nonsense all day. I have tried, but the the armor on this conspiracy is tough. I can't point out that ninety percent of the people dying in hospitals are unvaccinated because she will counter that ventilators are what is actually killing people and they don't want us to know. Her new thing she sent me, and you should watch this, is a short video by some grifter dude named Damien Bryant Filder. It's a thirty minute a three-minute gish gallop of 30 questions vaxxers can't answer. I've seen it. It's absurd. Also, this lawyer from Ohio that plays the reluctant hero doing a Giuliani-style lawsuits. Renz, I think I'm losing a parent. She won't get vaccinated and works as a greeter at Walmart and is not in good health. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm so sorry about that. All right, uh, four more. Champion and com a champagne communist. Uh, Sam, we can definitely be allies with a snake, but don't complain when they bite you like they did by not endorsing Bernie after they dropped out. Um, Josh from Chicago. Let's go Sox. White Sox, that is. Yes. Uh, really cool. Uh, it's casual hump day. That's what we call it. Wish you could have asked about the shadow docket. Second Amendment was not written in the context of wanting not to have a standing army. Can't yell fire in a crowded theater, last I heard. Uh, I think we got three more, right? Jessica, Sam, the individual gun rights that the caller talked about, us on the left need to change our discord about guns. We should look to events like Hayes Pond as reason why the us leftists needs to be armed against fascists. That's a separate, that's a separate uh, argument. Jay Chivone, caller seems to believe there are no infringements on First Amendment rights. And the final, I am of the day an individual right to own a gun wasn't recognized until 2008 if we're going to show some weird leftist deference to the constitution matt bradley emma great job today these guys will be back tomorrow i will be back friday bye 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 it might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Where the choice is made For the option where you don't get paid